but kumar may not be the third speaker this is natural fat burner chitra we are live uh, i'm there but my bandwidth is no probably video is not coming up okay hello dr maipal hi hi maipal hi 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 ram hi 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 good evening dr ram murthy sir hi hi anurag i need to leave by 7 so your talk is okay your talk would be done by then okay yeah you can't join back uh, ma'am we are live yeah uh a very good morning good evening to one and all of you refractive webinar has had a long wait in our arc webinar sequencing but then we are here today with a potpourri of very relevant and need to know aspects of refractive surgery to be addressed to you on the best platter we are lucky to have the top cream as refractive surgery is concerned on the expert panel our president dr mahipal sachde our past president dr d ramurthy Dr. Sri Ganesh, Chairman and MD of Netradama Group of Eye Hospitals, our Honorary Secretary Dr. Namrata Sharma, our Scientific Committee Chair Dr. Partha Vishwas, Dr. Rupal Shah from CFS Baroda, Dr. Himanshu Mehta from Mumbai, Dr. G S Dhami, IRSI President, to discuss red bear all the topics in this forum, and I'm sure all of you are going to enjoy. Dr. Praveen Krishna, the leading light of LBPI, would be moderating along with me. thank you dr praveen so without any ado we shall go on to our first enthusiastic refractive surgeon from pune who would set the ball rolling with a review of literature on why prk is superior to flap in a 500 micron cornea on to you varna thank you ma'am i will just all of us have to remember that uh, the, our talks are for 5 minutes and that fourth minute mr sunil will give us a warning and we should close by 5 minutes my screen visible we can see it yeah okay uh, first of all thank you dr chitra ma'am uh, what i'm going to speak to you about is going to be some review of literature about why the prk of surface ablation is superior to lasik procedure in a thin cornea which is 500 micron uh friends we all know that uh, basically when we are talking about 500 micron cornea we are specifically looking at the safety aspect of the refractive procedure amongst the predictability safety basically and stability the safety becomes of paramount importance in this uh, regard at this thickness so the burning questions are does the thinner cornea mean a biomechanically weaker cornea inherently does prk induce less biomechanical weakening as compared to lasik procedure is prk uh, so in turn inherently less prone for ectasia than lasik surgery and what about safety predictability efficacy and stability of prk in thin cornea in general so does the thin cornea mean biomechanically weaker cornea uh, as we all know in refractive surgery when it comes to the newer way of investigating these patients preoperatively the biomechanics is playing a very big role and uh, this has been shown time and again by very variety of studies that generally the central corneal thickness and the biomechanical parameters they correspond of course we have always seen exceptions to that such as having people having 550 600 uh, even 570 micron cornea with keratoconus and we have also seen on the contrary about 460 micron cornea which have been stable in long term but generally yes the thin cornea means that uh, probably a biomechanically weak cornea so does the thin cornea mean a higher probability of ectasia after corneal refractive surgery so uh, again uh, i think this factor has been looked at time and again and low pre operative corneal thickness has been seen to be a significant risk factor for ectasia in general especially uh, in the ectasia uh, risk scoring system by randleman et al uh, they have seen uh, in their cohort of patients when uh, patients had less uh, cct pre operatively as compared to the cohort which had normal outcomes uh, post operatively the thinner cornea was a significant risk factor 
Of course, the thinocornea is a risk factor which is probably much uh, below the uh, most important topographical factor, which is most probably the most important factor when it comes to the possibility of ectasia. The third question is that does PRK induce less biomechanical weakening than LASIK surgery? So yes, intuitively, as we understand that in BRK, as against in LASIK, we do not have a flap. And the studies have also already shown that the flap itself does not contribute to the biomechanical strength uh, post LASIK uh, per se. So in PRK, definitely we are preserving more uh, the, the specifications such as this real bed thickness and the PTA score has been more in term with LASIK. But even if we talk in general, definitely in PRK, we are actually uh, managing to keep a more stronger cornea behind. This has been seen by a variety of published literature already, which have looked at the Corvus as well as OBRA uh, studies in which they have shown that PRK definitely is much lesser invasive than in LASIK when it comes to the biomechanical stability post uh, in post-refractive surgery eyes. So is PRK also inherently less prone for ectasia than in LASIK? Uh, definitely there are uh, much, much lesser reports of ectasia and PRK. So this was one meta-analysis which looked at this and they have seen that out of 31,000 eyes, only nine eyes had developed uh, post-PRK ectasia, which was 0.029% of incidents versus post-LASIK ectasia has been seen uh, to be reported from 0 0.1 to 0.66%, so substantially higher. And again, a variety of reasons have been given for that regarding uh, the same, including uh, keeping the better strength, tensile strength, not touching the anterior uh, stroma too much by not cutting the flap. And of course, what has also been seen is that apart from much lesser ports of PRK, whenever the ectasia has been reported in PRK, One minute left. majority of this uh, ectasias have been reported after the first year. So only 10% had represented in the first uh, year, as against in LASIK more than 50% actually have presented in the first year itself. Uh, the most important thing is this contralateral case report. There have been three case reports in which one eye has been undergone, one eye has undergone LASIK and the other eye has undergone PRK. In this procedure, the LASIK eye actually went on to develop ectasia and the PRK eye did not develop a full-blown ectasia. In uh, one of the first published reports by my mentor, Professor Palikaris, then there was another report yeah, from Middle East by Zavidi et al. And one of the best documented reports is from India by Dr. Prema Patmanavan, madam. And as you can see very clearly, this was the preoperative scan of this patient. In the right eye, there was this uh, very inferior asymmetry. The left eye actually had much lesser asymmetry. So they actually performed a surface ablation on the right eye and they performed a LASIK procedure on the left eye with a corneal thickness of 500 micron. And the left eye actually went on to have a full blown ectasia, where the right eye actually, yeah, much, much stable results. Uh, my last slide is basically the PRK has, uh, in thin corneas, has also shown a great amount of safety, stability, efficacy, and predictability as compared to PRK in normal thickness corneas in this 10-year follow-up study, which was published by uh, George Alio. But of course, the last thing is that if you have asymmetric steepening or skewed radial axis, high myopia, residual bed thickness less than 400 micron, then uh, today, uh, even if you have a less, uh, 500 micron cornea, fakey chiral should be your procedure of choice. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Arman. You are concise and brief and uh, to told us all. Uh, one question I would ask is, what would be your uh, upper limit for doing PRK in a thinner cornea? So ma'am, I, I want to leave behind 400 micron cornea. So my upper limit will depend on how much ablation I have to do. Uh, in so I typically don't go beyond minus eight diopters in uh, surface ablation per se, generally speaking. So I have to have that marriage of the uh, amount of spherical equivalent that I'm trying to treat and leaving behind 400 micron cornea at the same time also. So I think whatever the equipment allows me to do, I, I will go for that. Uh, with a minus eight, uh, what uh, what uh, what is the duration of mitomycin which you would use? Um, um, for minus eight, I'm using 30 seconds as the duration for mitomycin C. Otherwise, for myovial less than three diopters, uh, I'm using uh, 12 seconds mitomycin C. Dr. Praveen, you have something to add because I I think that there is some issue here about different timings for uh, many of us. I would, of course, uh, prefer to keep it to minus five and very rarely there's no other option would I even consider a minus six. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, uh, I normally would keep it at 30 seconds, uh, due, uh, mitomycin. But I think Dr. Praveen is on 
Are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Chitra. Yeah. And, I think you have uh, yeah. yeah. No, thanks for the question. Uh, we've uh, actually looked at our results over 11,000 cases, uh, myopia up to minus 12. And then we looked at the results of PRK and high myopia. Uh, zero to three diopters of myopia is equivalent to six to nine diopters. There's no difference in the visual outcome or the stability. Between nine and 12, the accuracy is a little lower. The stability is a little lower. So I think uh, up to nine would probably be a safe limit. And uh, mitomycin C, we use a sliding scale, one diopter for every 10 seconds, and that seems to be working very well. Anybody else in the expert panel have anything to add on this? Vardhman said that you need to have 400 microns left. So if you have a 450 cornea, because her question, Chitra's question was, what is the least corneal thickness that you would take? So if you have a 450 cornea and a minus four diopters, would you do it? No, sir, definitely not. I think less than 400, 480 microns. I would probably. 480. Your sorry, cutout sorry. is 480. That was my what cutout is 480 for such a limitation. Okay. I mean, you can't uh, definitely be hard and fast in that rule because it depends upon the age also. If you have an elderly patient with a perfectly normal uh, symmetrical topography, then even 450 microns is fine to treat. Uh, I mean, so you have to consider all the parameters uh, before taking a decision. And uh, I think about 350 microns also is fine in uh, elderly patients. Uh, if they are over 35 or 40 years, then uh, the cornea remains quite stable. Yeah, I think I will agree. If it is probably younger female, then I think it is better to be more, uh, let's say, preventive. And if it is an older male, we can go further than the statistics. See, see, thanks for mentioning this because people do it but don't want to mention in a conference. I appreciate what you're taking the lead to say that. I appreciate what you're saying. That's exactly And even mitomycin, see, it depends. Like if if I have a post-LASIK or post-mild patient which I have to enhance, uh, then we don't necessarily go by that rule. Uh, and I generally like to use mitomycin for a longer period of time Definitely. because the haze is more. Yeah. Yes, I agree. For me, the take-home message from this very nice review is that if in doubt and if you still want to do LVCM, the patient qualifies for it, go for PRK. And we have LASIK, we have a smile, etc. But as far as safety is concerned, still scare. PRK is the king. And in case you are combining it with the collagen cross-linkage, still, uh, I think that's most uh, scientifically, uh, uh, intuitively right. And for us, we use mitomycin C for 30 seconds, irrespective of the amount of power that we are treating. And it has worked well for us and uh, with any hardly any documented side effects and very little haze. Uh, Chitra, I am audible. Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah, my father. See, I think uh, the first important step is how you really remove the epithelium, whether you're using manual or alcohol or viscoelastic or it's a trans PRK. Then how really you use metamycin? Any spillover from the cornea is going to give you a trouble whether you use it for 30 seconds or whether you're using it for extra second. And that makes the difference the complications do not occur because of PRK. The complications occur because of more of the chemicals we are using to complete the surgery of PRK. Yes. Any other questions before we move on to the next talk? Dr. Praveen, you have anything to ask? Oh, I think uh, most things are covered and in view of time, we'll probably move on to the next talk. And uh, for the next talk, we have uh, our uh, young dynamic uh, chairman of the ARC, Dr. Chitra Ramurthy, who is going to be speaking to us about why SMILE is a better bet compared to traditional methods of laser vision correction. Dr. Chitra. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Praveen. Uh, at the very outset, uh, in the background of the differing technologies which are there and contesting and competing, competing with each other, it seems relevant that we have an evidence-based understanding of why SMILE stands strong amongst them. Uh, essentially, there have been hurdles here. There is a lack of uniformity in the reporting outcomes. There are lack of RCTs and the meta-analysis are of low quality. However, the, the comparison of SMILE against LASIK is going to be compared in these uh, seven segments. Going further, it is seen that in different meta-analysis, the refractive outcomes when you compare SMILE to LASIK is equally efficacious and equally predictable. But there are certain limitations in SMILE. We all are aware that there is no tracking device or registration, no cyclotorsion compensation. 
And the treatment here, unlike in eczema, which is centered on the pupil center, here it auto centers on the visual axis. However, said then, a small difference in the pupil center and visual axis does not indicate a decenter dot. So the next important thing we need to look into the astigmatism. We do know that under correction of astigmatism is a bit of a bugbear in the smile, but then in any other procedure too, it depends on the magnitude of cylinder correction, the presence of anal carpa, if there's significant ocular residual astigmatism, the head positioning is not appropriate, the docking is not done well, and if the lenticule extraction is not complete. But keeping this in mind, different proponents have come forward to tell us that there is 10 to 12% under correction of smile, which occurs more so in higher grades of astigmatism. But having said that, a comparison was done between smile and femtolasic in different studies, which showed that there were undercorrections even in femtolasic, and this was not statistically different. However, suggestions have come up about manual compensation, triple marking centration, the consideration of 10% increment in the refractive cylinder value, which was entered, which could be made as a standardized treatment protocol. When we talk of manual cyclopotorsion compensation with a triple centration technique, you have the patient sit, sitting on the sit lamp and you mark the three o'clock, six o'clock and nine o'clock positions. And then you have them when they lie down, you, when you dock, you ensure that the reticule comes to overlie the three o'clock and um, uh, nine o'clock position. But again, that although the results have been promising with lesser induction of higher order abrasion or spherical abrasion, in higher grades of astigmatism, there is no head-to-head -head comparison again. But the most effective play role which SMILE plays is in the effective optic zone which it offers. We all know that it, it eczema, there is a peripheral energy loss and it becomes a smaller functional optic zone with induction of spherical aberration. And we all know that the effective optic zone size determines the area of greatest optical quality. And this is definitely reduced in femtosecond laser LASIK as compared to SMILE. This was an older study where there were 100 eyes were compared for PRK, LASIK, and SMILE by Dan Reinstein with equal pachymetry thickness and flap or cap equal thickness. And he, he professed that the SMILE was biomechanically stable. This probably encouraged the refractive surgeons to think that since my lenticule is being removed from the deeper stroma, which, which uh, definitely contributes less to the biomechanical stability, that we could probably treat higher myopic errors, but largely after understanding that our biomechanical tools are not that optimal, we would not try to treat more than minus nine diopters when we are, even if we are doing a smile procedure. There were various studies which have come forward to say, claim with the existing biomechanical tools that the smile uh, works favorably. We do understand that smile has a theoretical advantage of less weakening effect. It has inner and stronger biomechanics. And if you were to combine smile as a smile extra in some of these eyes at risk, the CRF has been found to be better. And the CXL has been found not only to cross-link the underlying stroma, but also the overlying cap. One and the sense of cross-linking is there, which gives it an extra edge. If you look at the ectasia, there have been very few um, numbers in meta-analysis, and some of these eyes were where preoperatively it was not noted. However, there were many papers which come to claim that PRK strands better biomechanically, then comes SMILE and then LASIK, but these changes are too subtle to warrant a change in the screening criteria. Confocal microscopy again seems to show that there is some amount of stromal reaction in his in some of these eyes earlier on, but these were more in those learning curves where there was a variability in setting the energy parameters and the surgeon skill. But something which stands to uh, remember is that there's a large vertical cut which we are doing a femtolastic flap against a three millimeter to five millimeter cut with the smile incision. And this definitely ensures there's a less cutting of the nerve, uh, nerve plexus and there's definitely less dry eye. In fact, there's a recovery of dry eye uh, status after smile within a month as against a barren appearance with femtolastic Thanks, procedure. Again, at different time points, when you look at the tear breakup time or the sub nerve plexus or the corneal sensitivity or the tear osmolality, in all of these smile scores over LASIK. If you look at the enhancement again in LASIK, it's 5 to 28 percent and just about 2.9 percent or less in smile. And the risk factors in smile are essentially patients over the age of 35 higher than minus six diopter, high astigmatism, and those who have had an intra-obstruction loss. 
And again, there are wonderful options which are there to consider if you're doing a smile enhancement. The, the most important and the last is that much discussed is a smile versus contura. And there was uh, one big study done by the Canelo Polis where he claimed that contura seemed to do better than smile. But we did a prospective study of 400 eyes, wherein we found that both of them were equally predictable, equally safe, and equally efficacious. In fact, we looked at the higher order abrasions, the vertical coma was just a little more in smile, and the spherical abrasions just a little more in contura. In other words, the results seem to be equivalent. The residual error is a key factor. But most importantly, postoperatively, all patients who underwent smile seem to be more comfortable. So I would like to conclude stating that yes, smile is an excellent, safe, and predictable modality with immediate comfort and lack of dryness. Biomechanically, superiority seems to be likely, but that needs yet to be established with better, more sophisticated tools. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Chitra. Lovely uh, review of why smile is potentially better than LASIK. So if you have a patient in your clinic and you do both LASIK as well as smile, who asks you to make the decision for him if he's suitable for both LASIK and smile, yes. what would you tell that patient? Uh, definitely, if in every way, if a patient is uh, suitable for refractive surgery procedure, I would definitely advise him to undergo smile. Um, in, the cost would be the only reason where I would uh, open up more on the other options. Of course, all the options are equally discussed to the patient, but I would be more favorable for doing smile because I'm quite convinced that it is quite uh, safe and there's an immediate uh, recovery. Uh, and I would definitely, although I do agree on PRK being a, 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 a treatment of great standing, but that initial discomfort which is there has to be kept in mind. So I would consider it more for those borderline cases wherein I would not suggest the other options. Femtolastic, by the very fact that vertical cut is there, I would definitely keep it as a secondary option. Perfect. Madam, Thank I you. Have a question and, uh, for you. Can I ask? Yes, yes please. Uh, Madam, if there's a borderline dry eye patient, would you do smile and not LASIK? Borderline dry because eye. Because the risk of dryness post smile is much lesser. In yes. which cases of borderline dry eye, would you do smile and not LASIK or would you not do both? No, I would do smile against LASIK. In which cases, madam? Like, for example, there are cases where we would reject the patient outright. Yeah. But in which cases would you do smile but not LASIK? I would do smile for all patients unless, of course, the dry eye is significant. Then I would need only to dry eye. With respect dry to dry eye. eye. Or there is some kind of a biomechanical, I feel it's a thinner cornea or those. Against femtolasic, I would advise smile, excepting high cylinders. No, ma'am, only with respect to dry eye. No, with respect Everything else eye. being the same. Yeah, in respect to dry eye, there's no doubt smile would do perform better than femtolasic. There is so much of cutting of nerve plexuses. There is no way I would suggest uh, femtolasic as against smile. The, the other point I wanted to just uh, discuss is that when we talk about biomechanics, we always talk about ectasia. Uh, but uh, I think ectasia is more because of a pathology in the cornea. These are abnormal corneas. But when we look at biomechanics in terms of long-term stability, and you look at both LASIK and SMILE and the enhancement rates, uh, we find that definitely with SMILE, the stability, long-term stability is much better. We have done over like 8,000 procedures now with uh, SMILE and our enhancement rates are just like 0.2% or so. With LASIK, it was 2.5%. And uh, I think Rupal also has published because she was one of the first to start SMILE. She's got probably the longest follow-up. And I'm sure she can also talk about this. So when you talk about biomechanics, it's also the long-term stabil stability of the cornea rather than just uh, ectasia. Yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Shri Ganesh. Uh, when we talk about uh, biomechanical uh, strengthening, it is not uh, just in the form of having ectasia. Ectasia per se is really in a very, very minuscule percentage of cases of all refractive surgery cases done all across the world with different platforms and different procedures. So ectasia is not the only thing that you are worried about. We're worried about the long-term stability and definitely smile scores better. In fact, uh, Dr. Chitra, I would, if there is a high cylinder, 
I would want to do smile rather than control AC because I found the results to be definitely superior in terms of the stability of the outcome that you get. I also wanted to ask you, Dr. Chitra, is uh, that one of your slides said that uh, there is more danger in in uh, older patients than uh, is it is it something like that? I mean, why would you be more careful in older patients or? Um, means, uh, you know, there were like three, four points and I didn't really get that. What did you say? I didn't hear you. Older patients? Yeah, you. one of your slides said so that you... Enhancement rates has been seen that are very few in SMILE and that too it has been seen in patients who are older than 35 or if they have a myopia more than minus six or a high cylinder or if they've had an intra suction loss. These hmm. are the situations where uh, there has been those limited enhancement rates. Uh, Praveen, question? Any other question? So, anything else from the other panelists? Uh, Dr. Mahipal, Dr. Ramurti, we would like to add uh, Dr. Himanshu. Uh, uh, can, I, can I just ask a question to the panel right now? Yeah. Absolutely. Tell me what is the, you know, I think the amount of dryness for LASIK has been overstated. Your cataract patients, all your cataract patients, how many of your cataract patients complain of dryness post surgery? We actually add with a two point two with a two point two millimeter incision at the limbus or maybe the cornea. We have more patients complaining of dryness than, in fact, routine patients. I, I just want an answer from the panel. What do you think? You agree with me that it's being overstated? Okay, Manchu, that could yeah. also be because we are giving a lot of uh, drops post cataract surgery for a longer period. So that could also be because because of that and not just yeah. the incision. And also the age no, no. group. If you look at the age group, the yes. cataract patients are the older age group. Older age. Many of them are postmenopausal women who naturally have dryness. So you can't really, it's not a comparison of apples to apples. It's like apples yes. and oranges. So you can't really compare <laughs> the two groups. Uh, All right. So, so any other question, Ramurti? You have anything to ask? Gaurav? I mean, uh, then, uh, uh, now Dr. Namrata, uh, warm welcome. Anything to add before we go on to our next speaker? Thank you, Chitra. Nice talk. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Kumar has yet to join us. So, Dr. Rohit, I think you should uh, share your screen. And Dr. Praveen, could you introduce Dr. Rohit? Uh, I don't think anybody needs to introduce him uh, because because uh, <laughs> I, I just, I just will, will probably say welcome, Rohit. And uh, Rohit is going to be speaking about uh, the reason why Contura probably scores over other forms of LASIK. Rohit, over to you. Thank you, Praveen. And uh, thank you, ma'am, and the ARC, and all the panelists and dear friends uh, watching this. Um, this, is, this is a full one-day session, you know, but I will try to summarize uh, it in five minutes, and then we can have a discussion. This is financial interest. The entire Contura is basically driven from uh, this concept. The concept about the curvature is not just only the curvature, it's not just astigmatism, it's a mix of a pie chart which mixes the higher and lower order adaptations. And this is not, I'm not talking about uh, keratoconus, I'm talking about uh, the normal patients. So how you correct this is different from how you correct this. And that's what the Contura is completely based on. And what we see when you look at a topography like this is uh, a cylinder, epithelium, how your ablation pattern is, everything is completely hidden, which we don't see. Now, more and more as we keep going on, we start looking at abrasions and what we need to correct from every aspect of it. The epithelial zernike and epithelial abrasions is totally taking up a major role now because it determines how your anterior and total is and of course how your lens is actually behaving to a certain accommodation. And for example, you can see that the epithelium itself contributes to some amount of astigmatism. So what I've done is uh, I compiled uh, uh, some articles of our own work with some of them are published and some of them are in review. Uh, on what Contura is different. These are all the uh, uh, groups, just to say it's safe. And you can see that the line of gain of lines, and this any machines will do. And you pick up any machines today in 2020, every machine can give this kind of a picture. And this is something good, but what is important is the depth of focus because it induces less Q value, minimal higher order aberration. Depth of focus was not something which was studied very extensively. And today, 
in today's context, let's start with today with lockdown or no lockdown. Depth of focus is probably the most important for a young refractive uh, patient who wants to come to you because it's it's taken as guarantee that 99 point of us who do refractive surgeon get that 6, 6, 20 by 20 vision. Very, very difficult now to give you a less vision with the machines what we're using. But what is really the new factor is the depth of focus. And that's what we looked at it. And that depth of focus, what was make me the most important selling point of Contura today. How does uh, all these concepts of depth of focus and all the quality of vision, of course, I'm not uh, denying that there is a quality of vision. I'm, Chitra ma'am rightly said there is a different quality of vision uh, with all these procedures. And more or less, I don't want to even debate on this. Every machine gives you the same thing. But one major selling point for me is we did the study and that's got published. We compared with many other platform and uh, this is the paper will be online and it just tells you how important it is. How is this the real future is looking at all these factors. Now, most of the modern machines, including Contura, don't look at your epithelial profiling and that epithelial profiling has to be built in the future generation of laser surgeries. Because in this case, you can see that this epithelium is in this kind of a cornea, which looks perfectly healthy, but you still have a close to 0.75 diapters of cylinder, which is come contributing to your aberrations. And that aberration, it's contributing to a significant amount of coma and trifoil. And this is a very important factor. And we are not treating this, we are going deeper into it. It's very important factor to be considered when you're planning a refractive surgery or contura in the future, because um, these are all the few things which we'll probably go into it. And we now are assuming that everything which is in the in the aberration platform has to be knocked off. It's like we, we look them look at them as a culprit, a jail culprit, and everything has to be knocked. But I, I feel that these things are more like a commensals. A commensals, I call them the commensal aberration. We need aberration to have a proper health and depth of focus. So we started looking at which aberration needs to be looked at. Now all this looks at research, but in future, all these machines can be customized. You can knock off only once you need and keep the ones you don't need to treat. And this I think would be the real future of customization. And uh, this is something which is, uh, which is just, and this we just launched now, it's a new software, Oculus, and we have joined, it took seven years to build it. A lot of uh, biomechanics machine and future topography machine will have it. It is the first artificial intelligence-based mathematical modeling where you feed in the data. It will tell you to, you don't need to worry about your biomechanics parameters. It will tell you how much does your cornea get weaker by different, different surgeries. And you can, you just had to click this. And now we are on a beta testing. Maybe next year it will be there in many Thanks of your... Up. And this is going to be the real future of how contura or epithelial modeling will be. So I just took a little bit insight into uh, digress into what the future is, but what contura is for me is a better control of abrasion. I don't say that it clears abrasion, it controls abrasion better, depth of focus, and the future is going to be on the use of simulation on AI and uh, use of epithelial maps. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wade. I know Kantura cannot be discussed in five minutes. Uh, there's one question I have. Like Largely, we do Kantura LASIK in a normal eye, wherein we feed in the subjective refraction and the subjective axis. Uh, now, you have a patient, otherwise normal eye, with some uh, higher order abrasion from induced coma, and you, you would treat it by the topographic axis with the C, uh, C4, C12 compensation. Do you, can you promise the same refractive accuracy to these patients as you would if you were to do a, a normal contura treatment? Basically, or would you promise them that you'll give them a better quality of vision, but there might be a small residual? Uh, if you are going to go back into looking at uh, the, the ablation pattern, when you treat, when you treat the refractive error as zero, and if your ablation pattern shows that the ablation is eight to 10 microns without treating a refractive error, then I will tell, and I'm sure that this contura will work very well for the patient. However, when you, when you keep the ablation at zero and you have absolutely, you have only two or three microns 
of ablation for a zero refractive error, that means the, the patient does not have any uh, higher order aberration. And this is important because you are not going to do any benefit to this patient. Whether you do this, or of course, you will do benefit because you are not going to induce anything. But Contura works very well in a patient who is normal but has higher level of aberrations which may do some changes. But the most important point which I want to bring in here is without understanding the epithelium, if you are doing a contour treatment, then epithelial cylinder itself could mess up with your reading because epithelial cylinders of 0.5 diopters or 0.7 diopters, diopters will not going to change even after you do your contour. So there has to be a little bit of optical understanding of this, but still in a normal healthy patient, I, if you ask me why I want to do it, and this is something which is got published also in GRS, it's a depth of focus. And the depth of focus is what is very, very important for a young person who works in IT or any of this. Rohit, I have some questions for you uh, regarding depth of focus. Okay, depth of focus in a young patient, basically the corneal abrasions contributing or correction of cor corneal abrasions contributing to depth of focus is very small. Maximum, it may be like half a diopter or one diopter. But these patients have very good accommodation. They have like nine diopters or uh, so accommodation with the crystalline lens. So that itself gives a very good depth of uh, focus. So how does this half a diopter or quarter diopter correction actually increase the depth of focus? Because depth of focus in young patients, again, is because of accommodation. So how much does it contribute? How can it make such a big difference? is something which I'm wondering. The other question is, see, I have seen so many patients because contura basically is based on treating the topography and the cornea. But I believe that refractive surgery is correcting the refraction, be it with fakic IULs, be it with LASIK, PRK, or with SMILE. And if the patient has 6-5 vision with glasses or contact lenses and is happy, then you just need to correct the refraction. And correcting the Topography itself can alter the abrasions and induce some kind of a difference in the lower order abrasions when you correct the higher order abrasion. So it may be a little off and it may not be as accurate as correcting the refraction. That is my question. And then there are so many patients who don't, who have a corneal cylinder, but they do not accept cylindrical power because they have lenticular astigmatism, which contracts the corneal astigmatism. And these, yeah. these patients, you do a topo link correction, and then they will have residual astigmatism because of the lenticular astigmatism. And this was my question also to uh, Kenelopoulos, and somehow he said that it gets corrected over a period of time, but we want the patient to be reading 2020 day one. So if the patient has lenticular astigmatism and corneal astigmatism, which are kind of correcting each other at uh, opposite axes, then how do you manage it? I mean, how does Contura work in such cases? I mean, this is my question because I believe refractive surgery is about correcting refraction. And of course, I would 100% agree if there is an abraded cornea. If there's an abraded cornea with corneal abrasions, keratoconus, where you actually have to treat the abrasions for a therapeutic reason, then topolink uh, corrections uh, make sense. But for normal standard corneas, I think just correcting the refraction would do well. I mean, and if you if you look at fake IULs, where you're not treating the cornea itself, these patients are among the happiest because you're just correcting their refraction. And when you when when you have a normal fitting, you always go and if ready-made suits uh, fit you very well, you can just go and pick it off of the shop because you know what you're going to get. You know the results. When you get a bespoke tail ring, you don't know what you're going to. It may be good or it may be bad. So that's my whole uh, kind of a logic. And I think this logic of using topo link for normal cornea is a little warped. Um, I would answer your question from the last question. Last question you asked about the, the whole cylindrical. Absolutely, I agree with you. And because of the paucity of time, I did not include. There are a lot of software, third-party software. We also build one where uh, you decide not to treat those patients uh, who have a high lenticular astigmatism. I mean, because we know that I call it the group three. Uh, there's one called four cities and we call, we have our own call at 3Z software. So you're right. So you, so you need to also have an eye trace to look at the internal abrasions and just doing corneal topography and deciding to do a contour would not help, right? Absolutely. Because see, what happens is the group three, which forms uh, group three is the lenticular astigmatism being higher, forms uh, 
three percent of your uh, contura patients. I mean, this is something which we publish, and three percent of them, if you put them in in your uh, bracket of uh, contura, they would not work. I mean, four CDs with Dr. Ramurthy uses gives a different platform. That's a different discussion. So you 100% agree on this. So in these patients, the total wavefront would do well, or a, just a simple aspheric treatment would do well. The second first question is about uh, uh, the second depth of focus. Depth of focus. Depth of focus. Optically, you have a different answer. In 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 reality, you have a different answer. Optically, if you have if I give you an answer, depth of focus, of course, it improves and all that. Younger the patient is, but where it really helps you, sir, is the patient. Who complains of end of the day fatigue, end of the day, and so many times we blame it on the dry eye. We say that the patient says comes to you that you know, and we took this sort of patients and started looking their depth of focus, and we believe that this patient should. I mean, they had a beautiful. You are right, nine to ten diopters of beautiful accommodation. We studied on Osiris, but the challenge was that poor depth of focus in them was creating. And the, the question is, does it happen to everybody? May not. So, so this depth of focus optically has a different, different uh, definition compared to what it actually translates on the patient. But having a good depth of focus in different ways, patient may not recognize it, but it may just help them. For me, if you ask me where it really helps them, is being comfortable after twelve hours of working without having any fatigability is probably gives them that. that confidence so but that also depends upon binocular vision and fusion and stereopsis because there was a there was a study by pravin krishna where he compared uh, lasik and uh, smile and he found that the stereopsis and uh, uh, fusion is much better with post smile than with lasik i think pravin can also so then the probably the fatigue would be less right so there are multiple factors I'll probably chip in, but that wasn't uh, contura. That was different uh, guided LASIK with the older platform. But I think what is important also is for depth of focus is to have similar aberrations in both the eyes. Is what we found. Yeah. If you have different aberrations in both the eyes, then actually you have lesser stereopsis, and so your binocular performance at close as well as uh, intermediate distance tends to go down. So I think maybe. Uh, uh the fact that contura probably corrects aberration similarly in both eyes probably is what resulting in uh, what rohit is uh, finding as well about having less fatigue and also the fact that the depth of focus is better i think i would like to just uh, shift gears and make a comment we have a galaxy of uh, speakers here with a wide uh, experience with various modalities of treatment for me it's a 20 happy patient was more important than 2020 <laughs> With all these developments, PRK, femtolasic, smile, I do all of them. I have, I know the positives and negatives, like all of you do. But I often wonder whether my patient in 1997, when I started off with LASIK, is was much worse off than what I am finding in 2020. I had unhappy patients then. I I have unhappy patients now. Of course, as far as the safety is concerned, understanding correct ectasia, dryness, etc., is concerned, uh, we have progressed quite a bit, and we hardly see any correct ectasia. But as far as uh, uh, run of the mill uh, a walk in the park is a uh, minus three, minus four day of test, with all the different modalities that are available to us, with all the extra expense that we subject our patients to, has the happiness quotient uh, increased? It's not only in my, but I have not seen any big published study which says that the patient, the refractive surgery patient in 2020 is happier than his counterpart in the year 2000. Comments? I think. what dr ramamurthy is saying is absolutely correct see these are uh, i would say these are uh, uh, when uh, zyoptics came in uh, we were among the first adapters to zyoptics and that was for uh, eagle vision and uh, 2014 or 2010 or whatever we were talking and it was basically at that particular time the abrometers were not good and i think it was garbage in garbage out in the sense that our zyoptics patients were less happier than the plano scan of uh, of the uh, of the bosch and no machine i think uh, shri and ram would yeah. bear, uh, bear that <laughs> but all of us uh, started talking about it because it was a marketing thing. and these are all uh, uh, things see actually uh, the best study would be uh, one eye smile the other eye uh, contura and seeing the happiness quotient of a patient from a real life situation as to from a real life situation does he feel which eye is better and i think uh, dr ramamurthy may bear bear us out but uh, i think they have done a study where i think uh,
80 to 90 percent or i i i he may be able to tell almost a very significant majority of the patients felt that the eye which had smile they in real life situation they felt better than that in that eye yes that's true uh, can I, you make a comment, uh, Dr. Namurthy? I think it's also we are uh, the culprits. We are putting these thoughts in the patient's mind. We are trying to educate or, you know, not actually educating the patients but confusing them into believing one is better than the other. And that plays a big role in the final expectations as well as the happiness quotient that they have. So we as doctors need to be more careful and also more responsible before we actually condemn or, or praise a technique. Uh, Rupal, you're not clear. Uh, there's yeah. some signal issue. Yeah. Uh, so we don't hear your question actually. No, so I was I was just commenting that it is us who are at fault. Because we are increasing the expectation levels of the patients and we are misguiding them about one technique over the other and that plays a big role in the final happiness quotient of a patient. And I think we all should be more responsible of what we talk and what we give to the patient in terms of education, the so-called education of the patient that we are doing. Uh, also, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, doesn't the epithelium mold itself after any procedure that you do? It's so changed. would it not matter whether you are going to do epithelial uh, customization, uh, even if you are able to do uh, epithelial mapping? post -op, that epithelium is not going to remain the same. So then how are you going to customize no. that post -op? What I said was, if there is an epithelial irregularity, do not tie to do any of this topo-guided treatment. You avoid it because you are not going to treat the epithelium because once you put steroids for two weeks with the two two weeks or whatever, and with when you cut your nerves, uh, you completely change. If you are doing a smile, that epithelium might still remain the same because you are not taking. There's, there's always going to be some hemostasis uh, balance because you're not cut the nerves. But if you are doing a LASIK, then if there is an epithelial issue, then I would not do it and probably. If there is an epithelial change like that, you would probably do a smile surgery because you know there is a hidden ocular surface issue which is creating the epithelium to mess around there. So uh, the, uh, what I said is I'm not compensating the epithelium at all. I would not do a topo treatment if I see an epithelial issue out there because that mm -hmm. epithelial compensation is completely missed in a lot of our custom-guided treatment is what we, the, the point I wanted to drive home here. There's one uh, Rohit, I would like you to answer this question in the sense that, you know, we started the optics almost together. You are really doing cutting edge uh, refractive surgery today. Do you feel that uh, your patients today are far more happier than uh, what you found when you started off with your refractive surgery? Um, the question what? is, question is it's, it's, it, see, we are so scared to ask our patients how yeah. happy you are. How happy you are. I think rather be the bubble that see I am I believe that I'm in a bubble assuming that whatever I'm doing is getting my patients very happy compared to what I did then so I would rather be in a bubble and be in my la la land so that uh, no, so one thing is definitely clear that we do understand a lot more than we did before and we feel a lot more happier treating these patients that you are better informed whether it translates to better visual outcome, we've not compared three to patients treated 10 years back with those who come now, because they were happy and these are also happy. One other question, uh, Rohit, uh, they say that- oh, One second. Uh, I think they were equally happy earlier also, Chitra. Now also they are happy only <laughs> I think yeah, in terms of complicated- One of the good indicators is the incidence of retreatment. Has it gone down over that? So because the patient's unhappiness is also dependent on you have got the patients as regards the refractive error and the outcomes. So at least over the years, uh, Ram, I feel that uh, the incidence of retreatment has gone down over the last couple of years. That is the only thing because maybe the nomograms have become tighter. Uh, maybe we are treating uh, better from that perspective. Sir, Otherwise, I think the happiness factor is still the same. Our limits of treating refractive error has also gone down. Earlier, we were treating higher amplitudes, but now we are not treating higher amplitudes. So that we, also will we can choose the right uh, modality for treating even extremes of refractive error. So each one has narrowed down. 
I, I just want to add one point if madam can permit so I can then uh, the, yeah. the concept of treating all abrasion is like concept of taking care of all bacteria in your ocular surface because it's a bacteria. I think this concept is something which I think has to change. And this concept, because of the optical work, I feel there are a lot in keratoconus patients, when you use adaptive optic to see how much of aberration, what to correct, you'll be surprised. Many of them want to keep the coma back. With If you take the coma off, it's like a foropter. Adaptive optic is like a foropter. The patient actually vision drops. That sometimes, that's why when you put a contact line, some patients actually drop the vision in their keratoconus. That means... Our understanding of mathematical optics is great, but our understanding on what optics happens on the patient is completely very, very poor. And this is exactly what I told Dr. Sriganesh, sir, that mathematically depth of focus is doing well, but how much it translates in the patient on a day-to-day -day basis is a completely different ballgame. See, the brain also has a filter which filters out the higher order abrasions, Absolutely. be it coma or spherical abrasion. There was also a study among Navy pilots who had 6-3 vision. And most of them had some amount of vertical coma. So it's not that all abrasions are bad. And some yep. patients tolerate abrasions better than the other. So it is something which their brain is attuned to. So that is something which is very difficult to decipher because we basically look at the only the optical aspect and forget what is beyond the eyes. But vision is more than just uh, the optical optics of the eye. Those Navy pilots had a fair amount of spherical aberration also. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. We shall now go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is our eminent professor, Dr. Titiyal, who heads the cataract cornea and refractive department of All India Institute, who is going to give us inputs on how to manage epithelial ingrowths. On to you, Dr. Titiyal. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, and uh, wonderful work from ARC team, a uh, wonderful discussion we had. Let me take you through some of the important issues in the post LASIK patients, that is epithelial ingrowth. We know that uh, incidence is quite less. It can be around 2.2 to 20%, but the re requirement of a treatment in a clinically significant in growth can be as less as 2% uh, or less. So that is a good part. And people have uh, described various classification of epithelial in growth in post lastic patients, grade one, grade two, grade three, depending on the uh, thinness and thickness of a uh, layer. This is a grade one uh, uh, epithelial in growth, which has a good demarcation line and thin layer, and you can have uh, grade two, which is thicker. You can say uh, slightly raised lesion in the interface. Sometimes they can cause uh, melting of the superficial uh, flap that can be grade three. So these uh, growths can have because of various risk factors. Patient-related risk factor has to be seen, especially people with epithelial uh, basement membrane dystrophies. And elastic surgery per se, I would say a uh, fifth to second uh, laser is better compared to the macular keratome use in these cases. Poor, poor flap addition alignment, intraop epithelial defect can also be a predisposing factor apart from hyperopic treatment with a larger area. Post LASIK, I think the flap manipulation or a retreatment is a major consideration uh, which can cause epithelial ingrowth in these cases. Highest risk can be seen within first three years of uh, surgery in these cases. And uh, prevention is always better, pre operatively good case selection, rule out epithelial problems, dry eye cases, intraoperatively, uh, uh, femtosecond, as I say, would be better than macular keratome. If you're using macular keratome, we should not be using from multiple cases. And if you have epithelial defect, put bandage soft contact lens on the table. Good examination in the posterior period, especially looking for flap alignment in these cases. But most important thing is when to intervene in such cases with epithelial ingrowth especially those growths which are causing visual disturbances or they are encroaching the uh, central area optical axis and with a significant induced astigmatism in these cases. Some cases will come in a very advanced stage with a flap melt and they would require initiation of treatment. Timing of surgery should be done if you feel it's encroaching the visual axis within a four weeks of initial diagnosis. So many cases may not require treatment because they'll be grade one or less and then less than two millimeter from flap S would require observation and see how they do it. You can have surgical or non-surgical alternative for treating these uh, visually significant uh, epithelial ingrowths. Flap lifting and scraping debridement is the mainstay of treatment in these cases. Yag laser can also be uh, primary uh, treatment. Some primary is, uh, 
treatment will be flap lifting and alignment, but you can have an adjuvant treatment to uh, especially recurrent cases. Firstly, to ensure the complete uh, removal of epithelial cells, and that can be with ethyl alcohol application or surface ablation, or you can seal the flap with sutures or fibrin glue or a hydrogel uh, sealant can be done in these cases. To prevent keratocyte reactivation or activation, you can use mitomycin C, and to have a better healing in a Cases of the flap melt, you can use amniotic membrane graft in these cases. Lifting of flap uh, would have chances of recurrence also, around 6 to 44 percent recurrence is, uh, has been uh, shown. I'll just avoid the video. Non surgical treatment, YAG laser is a good option in these cases, which is less invasive and it can be done in uh, grade one, two cases. But it can have complications like Bowman's membrane fracture, or you can have uh, damage to the superficial flap, and subsequent melt can occur. People have used 0.8 millijoule of power with eight micron spot size. The spot has to be adjacent. At a time, 20 spots can be One given uh, in these. So this is a study uh, published by a group, uh, Mohammed et al., where they found that the arc laser application gives you a nice initiation, like this is our case. The first spot is in the in the uh, lesion there. It gives a clearance. Bubble can be now adjoining to the another spot, and subsequently that can clear the uh, area of uh, entire epithelial growth. So this is a good way to look into. And if you look into some of our cases, this is one case who had a bilateral total epithelial defect on the table itself with the microgeratum used, and subsequently patient had. Uh, epithelial in growth picture coming. This is a right eye. You can see a significant grade two epithelial in growth. And the second eye of this patient had a viral uh, keratitis type of picture, which you can see here, subsequently patient received antiviral treatment. And uh, after healing of the epithelium, I started steroid and patient recovered very well, but also had a peripheral uh, uh, epithelial in growth of grade one. The important thing here is if you have a patient with a base membrane dystrophy, you can have epithelial uh, of uh, coming during the microcritum run, these cases would require a bandage contact length for longer period. And bilateral, this is a second case where uh, six months after LASIK, patient developed a large epithelial growth. So this is a case, there's no demarcation line. So this patient would require a, a definite lifting of flap and uh, scraping this, and maybe mitomycin C or alcohol to cause proper uh, disintegration of uh, this epithelial growth in these cases. You can see after our treatment here, this is a large pocket of a nest of cells which requires a scraping as such. Just to show one case of smile, which I saw after six months of smile, you can see a very small epithelial growth uh, in the superior side, which was uh, actually not hampering with the vision. Vision was 6-6 six, six in this patient with demarcation line. But this patient requires patient. In case this enlarges, we can uh, do a, a YAG laser in these cases, or there are various techniques have been uh, described in literature for uh, irrigating the interface to loosen the uh, ingrowth, then subsequently it can be pulled out with the forceps. And uh, use of mitomycin C or a cross-linking uh, with diboflavin is described to decrease the uh, incidences. The post plastic ingrowth can potentially be visual threatening sometimes, Retreatment, re-enhancement, or microcatum use uh, has higher incidence of uh, epithelial growth. Primary treatment is flap lifting. YAG laser seems to be promising in uh, some group of cases. Early intervention may be required. Adjuvant treatment will improve the uh, outcome in a recurrent cases. But uh, good thing is majority of cases may not require treatment. Simple observation will do it. Thank you for your kind listening. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Atityal, for a detailed uh, talk on within five minutes. One question to everybody in the panel and the uh, speakers. When you are uh, removing epithelial ingrowth, would you use uh, isopropyl alcohol alone or would you use isopropyl alcohol at one stage and then use mitomycin 2? Both, how is it? Opinions of the panel? Both can be used, uh, Dr. Chitra, because both have a different purpose, uh, this thing. Mm -hmm. Alcohol use will, you know, cause loosening of epithelial nest. So you can scrape them uh, completely. And mitomycin C is basically to prevent the, uh, you know, uh, uh, activities yeah. which are going to happen subsequently. So if you have a, a case which is grade two or more, you can use both of them and have a better results. Yes. Anybody so think, else has anything to add? 
one more point about the percentage of alcohol typically we tend to use 20% alcohol to remove epithelium but for epithelial growth to kill epithelial cells you need a higher percentage ideal would be about 70% because that will kill epithelial cells and prevent them from growing again and like professor titial said it would be advantages to use mitomycin c as well because epithelial ingrowth by itself tends to induce fibrosis in the surrounding stroma so mitomycin c can also reduce the haze that is there in the surrounding stroma so it would be good to actually combine the two yeah that is true i think people are reported uh, 30 to 80% uh, alcohol uh, in these cases and uh, specifically uh, you have to take away the epithelium in the edges of both from the flap and the, the remaining cornea so that you don't have a subsequent epithelial growth and that has to be done uh, think- one other question you have a flap melt rarely uh, epithelial growth and you need to remove it as a last resort why is it it does not have much of a refractive impact at all i want to answer from dr titial anybody in the expert panel i think that is true uh, i have also seen uh, one or two patients uh, where we have uh, followed them for longer period and subsequently the flap uh, melted out entire epithelial nest came off the cornea became clear and patient had a you know good visual outcome after that so it also showed that uh, the flap sometimes does not really contribute uh, significantly in these cases as a refractive uh, correction and even the uh, cases where we have done a flap amputation uh, in some cases despite that uh, results can be uh, satisfactory in some patients but i can understand if you look into uh, their uh, induction of uh, astigmatism higher order aberration will be definitely different and may require a treatment subsequently not not all cases will behave like that so these patients do require a subsequent uh, uh, management i think ideally a flap is supposed to be planar and if it's absolutely planar <clears throat> may not have an refractive impact as you rightly said it seems it's not always so maybe there are residual errors that are left behind my question is a little different in the sense that you know i used to lift flaps for enhancement for even 10 years after the initial treatment for many years but then about 5 6 years back a paper came out which said that 3 uh, years afterwards if you lift a flap the incidence of epithelial growth is much higher so any late uh, a regression i am using uh, prk which is obviously more uncomfortable for the patient as far as i know it's just one single study which showed that uh, it's almost 8% 8 times more in growth if you lift the flaps after 3 years like the opinion of the rest of the panel do you really feel that uh, epithelial in growth incidence significantly increases if you lift flaps for enhancement after uh, um, uh, for enhancement Yeah, I think Ram Ramurthy. In uh, what I have seen is, uh, it can be almost uh, up to fifty, sixty percent if you lift flaps uh, late uh, for enhancements. Or now I am doing some of those cases which I had done LASIK. So now they are coming back for presbyopia correction. I am doing presbyon for uh, these patients. And when we relift the same flap, then uh, we definitely see some uh, incidence of uh, epithelial ingrowth, and it's much higher than if you lift the flap earlier. Uh, there are various techniques again uh, one is you can just program a side cut if you just do a side cut and that is supposed to reduce the uh, incidence of um, epithelial ingrowth what i do is i kind of demarcate the uh, flap with a fine needle uh, throughout because what happens is when you lift the flap with uh, a sebal spatula or if you do a kind of a epithelial rexis uh technique then what happens is the epithelium does not tear exactly at the flap edge and then there is some amount of overlap and then if the flap is not created well then you can have um uh, some of the epithelium getting in and then uh, epithelial in growth so demarcating it or using a side cut again would reduce the uh, incidence of epithelial in growth and i always in such patients i always use a bcl Uh, after the procedure keep it for a uh, uh, couple of days and this also i find uh, reduces the incidence of epithelial dr praveen you have any other question a small uh, question uh, chitra yeah uh, hello to sir uh, sir uh, you showed in uh, the various cases there were quite a few of the cases in which uh, there was a small superficial uh, small uh, in growth in the superior part and there was one in which was in the inferior part part very small so such small in growths and uh, i would agree with what praveen said 
there are certain small boundaries of that fibrotic line that appears in the slit lamp, which can be seen quite well, and also in the anterior OCT. If these small ones are let to be, uh, then usually they resolve over time and do not require treatment, and especially if they are not causing any refractive error or an astigmatism or an increase of astigmatism, then uh, um, uh, many a times I've had to leave them alone because the patient was not complaining, though we had this uh, uh, this. Uh, in growth, um, it did not matter to the patient, so we left them. And over two, three years, gradually it did shrink. Uh, but there was that little band of fibrosis that always stays on. Uh, another case that I want to discuss here is very pertinent. So this is a case in which it was quite a large in growth. And uh, we, we were following it up. It was not causing the patient any difficulty. Then she said that she's not able to see well. Then we lifted uh, the flap, scraped nicely, uh, uh, alcohol 20% first time, mitomycin C also. Again, a regrowth occurred. Again, we scraped and again, uh, regrowth occurred. This time we used 80% uh, alcohol, but regrowth occurred again. We were very careful that uh, we took the edge of the flap also and scraped that part because that is the place where uh, the ingrowths usually occur from. There has to be one place where it is occurring. So we scraped that. But again, now it has recurred. Now, patient is not unhappy with the vision. So we are letting the patient be after the third time. Also, uh, most of the time, you know, the re recurrence of regrowth is happening because uh, we allow the you know, new epithelial cells to get into the interface again. Mm -hmm. So it is very important after you scrape out and uh, use your alcohol or mitomycin C to have a very nice opposition of flap with the you know, cornea. For that, uh, you would have to put a sutures so that there's a complete opposition. If you uh, uh, have access to other C lengths, that should be used. Mm -hmm. Use of bandage contact lens is quite controversial now. People have uh, reported, uh, some people have found that it is good, but many people have said it's not uh, going to safeguard the recurrence happening in these cases. It is the opposition of the flap which is very important in these cases so that the new cell doesn't go in. So that has to be taken care of. So another thing was very interesting in this case, somehow though we lifted the whole flap and then scraped also the undersurface of the flap as well as the bed and everything very well, gelatinous that uh, epithelial growth that there is. But even in the second time regrowth or the third time regrowth, the edge of the regrowth has not extended. Though we have uh, removed it and somehow it has not extended. Each time it does not extend, it stays just there and it stays put. So that is something that's quite a mystery. Another thing about Arka, Shriganesh, yeah, Shriganesh, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, just one thing that you uh, said about the uh, opening of the flap, the lifting of the flap in the retreatment. So um, there have been literature in which it says that if a spatula is used to lift it, the possibility of the epithelial cells going in is more. So uh, what has been said is to lift it with a forceps and uh, lift it so that there is no possibility of the epithelium going in, basically. And when the flap is again replaced back, it just grows on. Actually, it's even been suggested that you can scrape off the epithelium at the edge of the uh, um, flap so that there's nothing that can grow in and then lift it up. And of course, place a BCL so that it uh, regrows again. That is also said uh, to be this. See, I think basically there are cases where there is a fistula where you have uh, a track where the epithelial yeah. cells can come in. And usually, even after uh, treating it and putting back the flap, it's at the same area that recurs. Yes. And yes. there is an area of fibrosis, so it stops short sure. at the earlier area of fibrosis. Mm -hmm. Now, if you find that there is a fistula, either on uh, high-definition OCT, uh, or when you lift up the flap, you can see that the edges are not getting opposed well, then you have to suture or use glue. But sometimes they're just isolated patches of epithelium and there's no fistula. Then it's much easier when you remove these mm -hmm. and scrape it off and use alcohol, then usually there is no recurrence. So if there is a recurrence, repeated recurrence, usually there is a fistula and you have to deal with that. And ideally you have to suture that edge. Yes, thank you. I think paucity of time, we should move on because there are a lot of issues to be discussed. Our next speaker is our president, AOS, Dr. Mahipal who has definitely brought in vibrancy during the corona times, a blessing for his tenure, for the different strokes of learning he has evolved for us. He is going to detail us on how to treat flap strike. On to you, Dr. Maipan. 
thank you very much dr chitra uh, i'll be talking about dealing with flaps trya and uh, the flaps trya can be uh, classified uh, in various ways whether it's uh, whether they are micro trya they are macro trya whether they are fixed mm -hmm. folds or they are not fixed folds so exactly when you are looking at trya they are wrinkles in the cornea uh, which we see following lasik Uh, quite often they are small and asymptomatic, and uh, as uh, Dr. Dittyal in his presentation talked about epithelial ingrowth. Similarly, when you are looking at stria, what is very very important is that is the patient symptomatic, and the stria are they large enough, and when if and when they are approaching the visual axis, that is something which necessarily one needs to warrant a treatment. now the classification of stria can be as i told you mi micro stria which are small superficial wrinkles and these are usually asymptomatic and these involve uh, epithelium and basement membrane and the bowman membrane only but if they run deeper into the stroma uh, and they usually cause severe visual uh, impairment these are what are known as macro stria now what is the etiology of these stria so actually what happens is that there is a alignment problem between the flattened stromal bed so normally if we are talking about a myopic or uh, a myopic uh, uh, ablation that has happened so you are flattening the stromal bed and what is there is that the that the posterior flap surface is the, there is a mismatch that happens and there is a direct correlation with the quantum of tissue that you have removed during the ablation that means that if you are having small ablation the flattening would be less if you are having larger ablation the flattening would be more and this mismatch would there therefore be more the second thing which is very important is that the thickness or the thinness of the flaps these are so earlier when we started the laser vision correction when folds were a problem at that time ectasia had not come up so like a hansatome when uh, we started it was 160 and 180 microns and we wanted uh, even for my sister in laws uh, even i wanted that their flaps should be good so actually i did a 180 flap so that is that because we didn't want stria and we thought that the adhesion was much better uh, with the thicker flaps now microkeratome flaps are again which are meniscus flaps and uh, they cause higher stromal bed irregularities and when you are looking at the femto flaps they are uh, at 90 degrees or you can actually have uh, even an angle which could be more than 90 degrees so the chances of having uh, uh, stria are much less now in case you have manipulated much more and there is hydration of the flap or there is dehydration of the flap the adhesion and the stickiness of the flap will become uh, uh, different and therefore the chances of having stria are there and also it is also important that if you don't iron or if you don't swab the uh, flap into position and wait for it to dry then these are going to be a problem and therefore it is essential to observe the patient immediately after the surgery now you can see here these are stria which are involving the central part and you can often see that the patient comes back with halos glare and the patient is always an unhappy patient as ram was talking about happy 20 uh, uh, 2020 or happy patient this will be an unhappy patient and you have to dilate the pupil and try to look at retro illumination and maybe an aprometry can show you that there is a problem now what is the management in case they are detected early actually they should be detected on first day post operative even before going if there are uh, there is stria you should send back the patient to the or and have the uh, thing uh, redone if it is detected early you just can relift hydrate the flap and replace and iron it and this works only on day 1 if it is detected uh, much earlier now this is a case of uh, 35 year old female uh, which i have shown earlier also uh, lasik was done in 2019 june developed flap folds a uh, patient went back it was relifted and just put back right. and the patient was not uh, doing very well so you can see in this particular case i am showing you that there is a retro elimination and you can see the huge amount of uh, stria which is there now what is very very important for managing these stria is that the adhesion or the anchorage that you have of the epithelium into the folds has to be taken out so just see the moment the epithelium is taken out you can see how macro stria these are how big these stria are and obviously this patient would be very very unhappy so the total epithelium needs to be removed in this particular case you have to lift the flap and you have to hydrate the flap so you can see here that uh, the flap is being lifted 
as you lift the flap you can see you have to the under surface of the flap also needs to see that uh, it, it is uh, clean uh, we are putting a hypotonic uh, saline you can either put distilled water and you can wait uh, you have to wait for the flap to actually hydrate so once uh, the flap has hydrated uh, that is the time that you have to actually uh, go back and see this uh, you have to have two sponges which have to move at in the opposite direction and in this particular case you can see that uh, we are taking at about 50 degrees of uh, uh, the spatula which we use for the icc uh, and we are ironing the uh, the flap so this so this is a technique that has been described because this uh, loosens the folds that have happened and this patient i am doing after about a year of uh, of the uh, of the uh, flaps being there in this particular patient so you had to be very very aggressive so the aggressiveness is remove total epithelium, hydrate the cornea with hypoosmotic uh, uh, fluid or with distilled water and use the back of a spatula uh, at about 45 to 50 degree, uh, 50 degree and try to iron it out. It's similar to a steam ironing of your clothes. If you have to have the clothes, uh, 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 the wrinkles and the creases done, you have to use a pressure there and you have to have uh, heat which is there. And this is the unaided visual acuity of this patient who came to six. Uh, 7.5 uh, and the patient followed up with some time and the patient is happy and didn't come back to me. Uh, I think uh, the other important thing is that uh, to sum up, I would say that uh, you could also suture the flap which is there uh, and uh, these sutures need to be placed perpendicular to the folds and in the, some cases PTK has also been described which I haven't done myself personally. Now epithelial ingrowth presents in about 1.7 to 5.6 percent of enhancement procedures some studies only one study has reported a very high figure but the moment you are relifting a particular flap uh, that is when you have to be extra careful that you don't do excess manipulation and you wait for a much longer time and as was said rightly that a bandage contact lens helps uh, in these particular cases which is there uh, and epithelial ingrowth uh, has already been handled. So because uh, once you are actually removing the flap stria, because you are relifting the flap, you are removing the epithelium, the chances of having uh, an epithelial ingrowth post stria removals is much higher. And so you could uh, actually look at removing any, any epithelial ingrowths, et cetera, or uh, rests that are there. Uh, fibrin blue can be uh, used in these particular cases, which has been shown uh, to reduce the incidence of flap stria are uh, uh, very few instances of actually implanting the epithelium into the uh, uh, bed in cases of smile have been uh, uh, reported but typically smile does not give rise to fla flap fiascos uh, and uh, such as the stria micro or macro stria or also the epithelial ingrowths which are there so this is uh, the important thing is diagnose flap stria at the earliest dilate the pupil, do a retro elimination and do an abrometry if required and see how comfortable or uncomfortable the patient is. And you should intervene at the earliest possible if the patient is having discomfort and if the uh, stria are coming into the visual axis. So that is what uh, I would wish to say for management of uh, Dr. Maipal, one question. If you have a patient who has come to you after a bad road traffic yes. accident with a flap quite crumpled, there are multiple issues there. Would you try to somehow salvage the flap or would you discard it? So, Dr. Chitra, that's what uh, was said. Uh, uh, that has been the experience across the board that at times, even if you sal uh, if you sacrifice the flap, if it cannot, uh, anything cannot be done, it, the refractive effect is very little. So, it will totally depend on the situation the flap is as to whether it is self uh, salvageable or not. See, a road traffic accident normally until, of course, the flap got amputated is normally salvageable. Sal non salvageable flats are if you have buttonholes, you have tears in the flaps, or you have infections, or you have melts. Those are the type of flaps which you may not be able to salvage because an RTA, the patient had a good flap and the flap got dislodged because of not even an RTA or even a uh, blow to the wrist thing or a uh, football injury or whatever it is. So at that particular time, if the flap is there and uh, you do not expect any infection, you it is better to salvage. But in case you feel that already there is infection that is coming in, the flap is in a bad situation, then uh, at times you may not be able to salvage it. One other question. Uh, supposing... Uh... We know that for a macro stria, we are going to do epithelial debridement and then only deal with it. For a micro stria, it is not the second day, but the patient comes in much later with micro stria. Would you want to do an epithelial debridement or would you try to iron it out and do the other things? 
No, the ironing, see, if the patient is coming back to you, they are not actually microstriae because they are visually disturbing to the patient. That's why the patient is coming. So under those circumstances, if it is coming in the visual axis and if it is late, there is no way that until, of course, you, that is what I'm trying to say, be aggressive because this is what was happened in this particular case. That this case went to a premier institution. The patient was picked up. The flap was relifted. They did the. Uh, they tried tried to do the stretching, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No epithelium was removed. There wasn't any aggressive thing. The patient was back to square one. There are these anchorages which happen. See the. Uh, there is a remodeling that has happened, and these anchorages of the stroma are very firm. So until of course you actually remove these anchorages, swell up the stroma so that these uh, they, then these undulations uh, can go they will not respond. So if it is a late management, it's only, I would say, the first 24 hours or maybe max 20, 36, 48 hours that uh, these stria, if they are there, they can be taken care by reposition. But if you come on to longer, three, five, seven days or one week, etc., uh, it is always better to remove rather than, again, having the patient to go back to the uh, OR uh, to uh, remove these uh, macro stria or uh, stria which are there. Dr. Praveen, many, many, Dr. Praveen. Yeah, many a time. Many a time. Yeah. The microstria are missed. So I just wanted to give my inputs. My macrostria, the patient's visual acuity is reduced. So yes. patient is unhappy and the vision also drops and then you have to manage it. But many patients, the microstria are missed because central microstria, especially when you have a thin flap, LASIK, and you're correcting high refractive errors, you get fine the microstria. And like my Paul said, you have to dilate the patient and do a retroillumination examination, otherwise you cannot pick it up. It cannot be picked up on OCT also. But the best uh, test for these are the OCAS or HD analyzer, which shows an increased scatter. So even though the patient is reading 6.5 or 6.6, they are very uh, unhappy because they have a high degree of scatter. And this can be picked up in the HD analyzer. And rightly, the epithelium has to be removed for this and it has to be treated aggressively. Otherwise, you will have an unhappy patient. And doc, what Shiri is saying is absolutely right. There are patients that I have treated who have gone to from one ophthalmologist to the second to the third and fourth and they have said these are microstria and nothing needs to be done. But the patient is very, very... To the extent that a patient was... One patient I have recently treated was on antidepressants. The patient was so very depressed and the doctors are saying there's nothing, there is nothing. We will not enter. There was a big dilemma. So I said, no, please come. I will treat them. And then there was a big debate because he was, the patient was a very anxious, depressed patient. So under, under those circumstances, the patient had a lot of discussions. I said, no, please do. Please let, let us not ignore these because you are very, very symptomatic and you have gone into a situation where you have left your job also uh, because of uh, these uh, microstria and they were right in the center. Yeah, if you do a HD analyzer, you can yeah. typically see the OSI is very bad. Though the patient has 6-6 vision, the OSI will be 5 or 6 which shows that the quality of vision is very poor. That's why they are depressed. Yes, Dr. Praveen, any other question you have? Nothing from the panel, but then uh, for all the attendees, we would request them to put in your questions on the Q&A panel so that we can pick up your questions for the panelists as well. Uh, I think also, uh, Dr. Maipal, do you ever use PTK after you divided the epithelium if you have flap stria that don't go away? See, that's what I said. I have never had the uh, need to do that, but obviously that is written. And uh, I gave the disclaimer that uh, for sake of completion, I told, but yes, in case there are, and that is that is when uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rugosity is not going, the irregularity in the cornea is not going, because you can go ahead and do a PTK. It makes a good uh, logical sense to do that. Uh, in case uh, they, they are recalcitrant to uh, you're trying to uh, smoothen them out uh, using all the techniques that I have said. But I have never had a problem in case I have been aggressive enough to treat these stria uh, and uh, uh, do them the way uh, uh, I, am, I normally do them. Just an observation. I mean, the post smile, as Maipal mentioned, the stria do not occur. But I have found some wrinkles, especially if you removed a high power lenticule and this is more because of wrinkling at the Bowman's level. So routinely nowadays after removing the lenticule, I hydrate and then uh, uh, do a certain amount of ironing from up down about 8 to 10 times. I do find that uh, this gives a more pristine cornea and better visual acuity on post-operative day one. Uh, Dr. Praveen, shall we go on to our next speaker? Thanks a lot, Dr. Yeah. Maipan. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we have a lot 
the box coming up. So thanks for the excellent uh, talk and the lovely panel discussion. So next up, we I have... Just quickly uh, take a comment. Uh, maybe after this talk. Yeah, if you don't sure. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be leaving. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I think uh, comments on Flaps try might be relevant to the next talk as well. We have Dr. Sujata Mohan, uh, who is a very uh, vibrant refractive surgeon from uh, Rajan Eye Care Hospital in Chennai, who's going to be talking to us about the next level of flap complications, which is management of free caps. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Chitra for giving me this opportunity. And um, uh, there's a study uh, which was published in JCIRS in 2002, which says the incidence of free cap is 0.004% to 1.31%. This was in 2002, and with the advent of femtolaser and uh, SMILE, I'm sure the number of uh, free caps we see will be almost nil. But anyway, uh, I'm just going to go through what I would do uh, if I have, uh, have to deal with a free cap. What are the common causes of free cap? Flat, very flat corneas, deep orbits, large corneal diameters, and also tiling of the dehydrated flap is one of the causes because of mishandling by the surgeon. Incorrect assembly of the microkeratome, poor positioning, surgeon forking the microkeratome, failure of the stock mechanism or incorrect setting of the stock mechanism, stock mechanism, and lastly, a uh, drop in intraocular pressure during uh, suction. There are different types of free caps you can get uh, based upon what is the reason that you have a hand. I'm not going to go into this. So this is a one case which I had in uh, 2004. This is a, a Moria M2 microkeratome. And um, as the uh, uh, microkeratome reversed the second pass and I lifted up, I could see there was no uh, uh, flap. Fortunately, I was able to identify it in the microkeratome itself. And when you uh, see a free cap, the best way to deal with them is to uh, fold it, tackle it, and uh, uh, store it safely with a drop of saline in some place. And then you can go ahead with your ablation. Here, I just put the saline and tackle it on the microkeratome itself. And the reason why we have to tackle it is to, to find out which is the right side, whether which is the epithelial side and which is the stromal side. If you just keep it in a Petri dish uh, unfolded, then we are going to be in trouble because the, it's going to swell up and will be very difficult to identify it. And once you have put the right side down, then you can adjust the flap so that you can align the uh, marks which have been pre-placed as you can see. Alignment is very important because here the free cap is usually uh, extremely round and it will be very difficult to uh, find out the hinge. So it's important that you identify the uh, pre-placed marks and align them well. Also make sure that the gutter that you see is even all round and you can uh, wait for about uh, two to five minutes, make sure that the flap is really well stuck and then apply a bandage contact lens. There are people who would prefer to suture the flap as well. And that, that is also a possibility that you can look into if you feel that the flap is too thin and you, there's a chance of dislodgement of the flap. So this is another case um, of a, a free cap. You can see that, I mean, it was a uh, case which uh, we could hardly expect a free cap, but once um, uh, the microkeratome uh, came back, and uh, you can see that we are searching for the flap and it's not visible anywhere. And again, it was identified on the microkeratome uh, itself, head itself. That is very important. So the most important thing to remember is just look for it immediately and make sure that you're, uh, see here, I'm just checking to see that it is a nice round because sometimes it can be a torn. And this is a very thin uh, uh, flap. So thin flaps are much more difficult to handle. And uh, it's important that we uh, uh, hydrate the interface so that you can move the flap around. Make sure that it's, uh, this is very important because if you leave any gap, then the chance of epithelial ingrowth increases. And also finding the correct alignment is important because otherwise a misaligned flap can uh, cause a, a high uh, level of astigmatism. So this, the, the steps which I've done in both the cases, though the two different microkeratomes are almost very similar. You can actually suture the flap also, which I've done for uh, patients with epithelial ingrowth or uh, after flap striae, but not in this instance. So uh, the complications of free cap are when the flap is placed One upside down. So the best thing would be to attack with the flap. Epithelial side is identified by staining. This is a loss of disc. Place a BCL over the free cap. Suture the hinge. In case of a high astigmatism, reorient, you have to go back, take the patient inside and try to reorient to the correct position. 
preoperative marking helps the realignment. And in cases of high astigmatism, in which uh, after realignment, the viscoretic visual equity is not good, then you can go for a topo guided away from a uh, guided laser. In epithelial ingrowth, I think there are uh, several papers on this. And it's very difficult to treat epithelial ingrowth after a free cap because you don't have the hinge and uh, the chance of recurrence is very high. So I think already it's been dealt with by Dr. Tityal. And again, uh, suturing uh, the hinge or putting a BCL will definitely help. And again, I would insist on a, a pre-placed mark, particularly when you're anticipating a free cap. And in case of flat micro and macro striae, striae removal again is difficult in these cases because there is no hinge. And in some cases, probably you might have to replace the flap from a donor, or you can completely amputate the flap and allow the epithelium to grow in. So the tips for prevention are, uh, look at the corneal diameter and keratometry in each patient. So make sure that you don't get a free cap. A stopper should be checked before every procedure. Make sure the suction is adequate. Use pre-placed corneal marks, and that's helping me all the time. Patients with very flat corneas, you have to anticipate a free cap and take the extra precaution. And now with the advent of femtosecond laser, I think these free, uh, patients who have uh, potential for developing free caps should be converted into a femtolasic or you can always do a surface procedure and or do a smile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sujata. Dr. Praveen, you have any questions for her? None from the panel, but I guess the summary is the fact that if you have a free cap and you suspect one, always examine your microkeratome before you actually uh, start to clean it up or give it to somebody else. So very nice presentation, Dr. Sujata Mohan. Have you ever had a situation where you've lost the flap and uh, you had to proceed with the ablation and you had a good outcome as well? No, I've just had these two cases in at least 20 years. That's all I don't have. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't have them. Just, uh, I would like to just give one practical tip. If you have not marked the cornea and then you have a free flap and uh, then you have difficulty in identifying, look at the light reflex because on the epithelial side, the light reflex is usually crisp. And on the stromal side, it is a little, uh, it's not that crisp, it's a little blurred because the stroma, the surface is not so smooth. Uh, whereas the epithelial surface is very smooth. So if you look at the light reflex, you can identify the right side. Oh, yeah. the corner, a flap becomes edematous. I had a, a, a friend's case. I had to assist a friend's case. And I found that it was very difficult to identify the stromal side because the flap became edematous. Yeah, if you take it out immediately and then inspect it, uh, and that's another but, very important thing that is in high, high or, volume centers, what they do is immediately after the cut is made, it, it goes for washing and autoclave and... Uh, by the time they realize that uh, yeah. the flap is in the microkeratome, it's already gone yeah. for Alternatively, you can also strain it with a tri Or what, or I, what I do is try to strain with the tri blue dye, and the epithelium side will not stain. There are two other tips for identifying the epithelium and stromal side. One is you just touch it with a swap stick or something on the epithelial side, it won't stick. Well, on the stromal side, it will easily stick. And also, if you do a very gentle scraping on the epithelial side, they yeah, a little bit of scraping. On the stromal side, there won't be any peeling off. Yes. So just in case you have a problem. Yes. Also, I like to leave it in my microkeratome because there is enough wetness. Epithelial surface is up, the stromal surface is down, and your stromal bed is becoming very dry. So it's better that you go ahead and do the refractive portion first, and then look at your flap because uh, otherwise. Holding it would really make a difference because you know exactly which side you are on. Just tackling the flap really helps because then you will be very sure about which side is up and which side is down. Very rarely a person hasn't done a limbus to limbus orientation and the flap has got rotated. What would you advise uh, about these patients? Do you see them the next day? If, uh, if you, you mean to say if there is any gap or uh, uh, there is some astigmatism, See, we have to intervene if there is the best uncorrected visual acuity is not good. Patient has a striae or patient is unhappy with the vision. So the orientation in these cases are very difficult because most of the free caps are extremely round. We are not going to get a hinge at all. So definitely we may have to go inside and realign. And you can use those, um, you know, those astigmatism markers to, so that they give you a reflex. 
I mean, this is one of the papers I read about in which they've used the markers to realign the flap and they've uh, used the, uh, the reflexes to make sure that the alignment of the flap is uh, good. So this is just a small tip. Uh, Dr. Chitra, I wanted to just chip into what uh, Dr. Rupal just said. That in fact, I like to do exactly the same thing. If I have a free flap, I'll you know let it be on the you know micro keratoma. I'll let it remain there. Put a drop to keep it wet, and you know finish off with the ablation because the orientation also remains the same, and you don't have to kind of you know then you just take the head back there and you keep it right next to the eye, and you know you yes. maintain the same orientation, so the rotation and everything will not happen. I mean, even though you've marked, but still it helps because you know you just then slide it back from there and put it straight onto the on here, you know the exact orientation, how it was cut, and you maintain it. You know you don't kind of play around with it and take it off and make a taco or whatever. So I've, I've also found that very useful in those rare instances that I've had. I agree, small with, uh, Gaurav, uh, I agree with Gaurav very well about this, and uh, it is very simple. Just taking it uh, very close to the bed and just sliding the flap on exactly. the bed. So it yeah, is exactly. absolutely on the same plane. And uh, the other thing that uh, Dr. Sujata, you were question about uh, the rotation. Chitra asked this question about a rotation if the mark is not there. So the flap is now, the cap is now so precious that I would not like to lift it again uh, if it rotates or does not <laughs> rotate. I mean, let it be put and uh, even if there's a small astigmatism, uh, let it be there. So, uh, yeah, but it's usually a big astigmatism if there is a lot of uh, disorientation. Uh, what I like to do is if I know that I may not be able to rotate it back and it's been there, there for some time, what I do is I see the new refraction, let it stabilize. And then this time on when I'm opening the cap, I mark properly and I make a pseudo hinge so that I, I can put the flap back in the same orientation as before. Treat this refractive error which is induced now so that uh, in, in this new position of the flap, Whatever is the induced refraction that you treat with examination. Uh, Dr. Praveen, uh, we go on to our next speaker. Could you introduce? Yes, I think we should. And uh, introducing uh, the next speaker, uh, yeah, Dr. Gaurav Lutra, who is the president of the ARC at the IRSI. Uh, Dr. Gaurav Lutra is from Dehradun, doesn't need any introduction as well. But what some of you might not know about him is he's a fantastic tennis player as well. So, <laughs> Gaurav Lutra. <laughs> Thanks. You're going to be talking thanks. to us about uh, treating regressions. <laughs> thanks, uh, Praveen. And thanks, Dr. Chitra and the whole team uh, for inviting me. And let me quickly start. I know you've given us so little time that we have to rush. Okay. Uh, so how do I tackle regression? Regression is original refraction and is dependent on two, two, three variables, several variables for that matter, but most importantly, the preoperative myopia and the amount of correction. And it's largely due to the epithelial remodeling and to some extent the stromal remodeling after laser refractive surgery and also much beyond that. Uh, all the refractive procedures have small differences in their regression rates and their long-term and short-term uh, changes as well. But over a period of time, they tend to become pretty similar. And I actually, in my practice, like to differentiate regression from progression, which may happen due to increases in axial length. So we typically document axial length for all our patients for the last 10 years. And, you know, uh, the patients who have come back after seven, eight years with changes in refraction, and we found that it was uh, due to increases in axial length. Uh, and then it becomes very easy to explain to the patient. So keeping records of all patients' axial length is great for yourself and for the patient to understand what's going on, whether it's a regression or a progression, and it becomes easier to explain to them as well. Now, this was one uh, nice study that I found, which uh, checked out on the factors affecting long-term myopic regression after LASIK and comparing it to LASIK or uh, surface treatments for moderate myopia. And uh, here you can see that over a period of 10 years, they had uh, divided their groups into the regression group and the uh, non-regression group. And the first uh, A is the LASIK group and B is the surface group. And you'll see that uh, in both of them, uh, it's pretty similar. And towards the end, you know, they kind of match up. And uh, it's about minus 1 to 1.25 is the total thing there. And similarly, uh, if you look at astigmatism, you'll compare LASIK, femtolasic, and PRK. You'll obviously notice that PRK doesn't, uh, you know, hold up that well for treating significant astigmatism. For small astigmatism, it's, it's about the same. And LASIK tends to have 80% uh, patients even uh, after a few years, uh, you know, setting up well and a little lesser for PRK. But I do PRK for astigmatism as well. And this uh, shows you the corneal thickness changes over 10 years compared between left LASIK on the left and PRK on the right. Now you'll see a huge change in the PRK. So it's typical that PRK will have more significant epithelial remodeling changes as compared to a, a flap-based procedure over here, which is uh, LASIK. 
now coming on to a comparison between what we've been discussing smile and uh, lasik they stack up pretty pretty much the same so conclusion was they uh, almost no difference was observed after 5 years but a regression rate of about minus 0.02 plus minus 0.39 in the smile group and a minus 0.12 plus minus so practically the same uh, in uh, in a 5 year follow up so uh, this is how however the epithelium would differentiate between lasik and prk in lasik you can notice that the uh, epithelium thickness changes are there and they reach a particular level in surface treatments obviously the epithelium will first be very thin and then it kind of comes up and over a period of time you'll see that they come pretty close to each other now why epithelium thickness mapping has become so important of late is because we understand refractive surgery so much better and you can see that uh, this epithelium is typically around 50 microns and for patients who come in with regression it becomes very nice to uh, you know study the epithelium because especially if you have the pre op and the post op epitheliums and then you notice some changes happening it's great to document this we document it for every patient now you can see here the central epithelium being much thicker and uh, in the post myopic ablation similarly over here this is a typical myopic ablation and you'll see how the epithelium forms a meniscus uh, kind of thing over here compare that to a hyperopic ablation where the periphery will be the guttering is there and the steps are more they are more steep so typically a hyperopia will have more changes in epithelium both for lasik and surface but much more so for surface ablations and rarely you'll have a surprise myopic epithelium with peripheral hypertrophy and you will have a surprise and you might see feel that you got a significant overcorrection but if you check out the epithelium mapping you'll typically know and you will not intervene immediately now for our patients what we typically do is we see our patients on day 1 day 15 3 months 1 year and then we keep calling them if possible annually otherwise at least once in 2 years or report sos and what we check up on all follow up visits is obviously the vision and the auto ref which really goes well one minute sir we document the auto refs the pressures i would strongly suggest topography at 3 months and 1 uh, year if possible and then sos if required i would prefer the pentacam because it also gives you the corneal thickness profiles and you can monitor these patients well and when we need to do we would typically monitor the epithelium thickness and we do an eye trace if possible if we notice a regression or a surprise and we of course ask them for a peripheral retina exam axial length as i told you so when to suspect regression first month is more likely to be an undercorrection if you're getting some uh, some significant regression but look at the epithelium uh, try to put them patients on topical steroids at 3 months typically most patients will stabilize and then on the annual visits you know uh, you can do an objective exam or if the patient complains sometimes they come after many years however you should always be on the watch out for ectasia because in the first 2 3 years if there's a patient reporting sudden diminution of vision or if there's a in first place they do definitely need to follow ups and on order if you see unexplained astigmatism you can immediately be aware of something going on immediately to a topography this is a case which we had of a 40 year old male 18 years uh, lasik done elsewhere came with diminution of vision for one year and we noticed this uh, ectasia in one eye and inferior steepening in the other eye this is a long period after the surgery and uh, of course the pentacam showed ectasia in one eye now when we took a detailed history he showed up history of rubbing of the eye for the last one year because of dry eye he was having poor ocular surface we did go ahead with the cross linking but the pearl was that post lasik ectasia may happen even many years after lasik and eye rubbing may be a cause so please watch out for ectasia even 15 years after lasik of a patient suddenly presents with one now if you have a patient with documented regression ask for a recent history of pregnancy excessive near strain in the last 6 months we've seen some of our patients who were stable for 10 years coming back with lot of computer work and lot of phone use and having a sudden change in their refraction and uh, this has been one factor look for lenticular changes look for the axial and changes look at the ocular surface definitely do an epithelium mapping and a pentacam initially prescribe glasses or contacts don't jump to operate these patients with regression observe them for at least a year or so and then decide what you would like to do and most patients will understand that this is what they do so counseling is very very important and uh, enhancements if you've planned then you could be doing an early intermediate or a late enhancement what's been popular in the past was to do to lift the flap but i prefer to do surface treatments most of the times unless uh, you know there was a, a situation where you can do a flap lift so when do i like to lift the flap if it's your own operated patient if your flap data is available if there is an adequate residual bed and if there be no flap complications and it's a recent previous surgery and you have a good bed now when we have a lift of the flap you have difficulty you currently identifying the flap edge if it's been there for a long time but you can do that on the slit and which flaps not to lift if they are ultra thin flaps uh, 70 to 90 microns especially if they are you, you have been documenting the flap thickness if it's especially more than 6 months if there was a flap complication 
or if it's been a very very long duration surgery and the edges are not clearly visible especially the femto flaps may be sticking very well so early enhancements please lift the flap and uh, you don't really need to do anything on the surface intermediate which means a few years down the line flap lifts are usually possible and predictable but you might want to shift to the surface as well and if it's to, if you're doing enhancements after many years i would uh, preferably go to the surface because uh, you know flaps used to be very thick in the past and some of these patients may have very thin beds and flap complications may not be apparent over the years and uh, this is one patient who came up to me looking for a uh, enhancement she was a young lady and uh, she was going to get we'll have to conclude dr gorav uh, so let's go to the last slide uh, yeah summarizing early enhancements you can lift the flap or maybe go on the surface if you have a flap complication intermediate lift the flap or be careful about that and if it's a late enhancement please go to the surface uh, surface enhancements are gaining more acceptance and flap lift may be better only for the early first year enhancements if you would like to do them thank you actually i didn't hear the call for the last minute i heard the last minute and then i didn't hear that the times up so i was waiting for the times up to come around and i'm sorry we just a thorough talk very good talk i just want Thanks. one question uh, to the audience uh, to the panelists like do you believe in giving uh, anti glaucoma medication for early regressions and if so how long would you want to give anybody on the panel or even gorum could answer i don't I, i don't do, do, do i don't i'm aware of the fact where that uh, it was it was studied but i don't do that dr praveen Well, I do. Uh, in I do. fact, there is a publication that uh, talks about using iotim of all drops. That actually seems to show that it tends to uh, uh, inhibit regression, but the effect seems to last only as long as you have the drop. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's not something that is uh, therapeutic. It probably is something that is mainly a little prophylactic to buy you a little more time. I think what it does is it causes uh, some drying and thinning of the epithelium, which reduces the amount of. Uh, regression and then this is what is seen and once you stop it again it kind of uh, recurs so generally i don't use uh, anti glaucoma medication gaurav i just wanted to know do you routinely check axial lengths is it a good practice to measure ag axial lengths for all these patients that's exactly to, uh, from the medico legal point of view to uh -huh. find out whether it is regression or true progression because it's only the axial length which will Uh, tell you and save you also if the, if the patient gets aggressive. Absolutely, we, we in fact all our refractive surgery patients get their ex axial lengths documented at the time of surgery, and then you know on follow ups if we notice a you know a regression potential regression or a change in refractive error, it really helps to document that. And patients typically would see that, and you can show them uh, the data. They it's very easy to explain to them that uh, if you had a progression, that it's not really a regression. What is your take on the no, extra no, procedures no, for uh, preventing uh, regression? Because this was something that has not been covered and. i think there's a lot of it there's a, there's a controversy on whether extra procedures prevent uh, regression you know so I, i i went through the data and you know i thought it best not to cover because it's very controversial and uh, you know there are data uh, showing you know both sides of the story that you know canalopulus has of course uh, shown uh, data on hyperopic uh, lasik that uh, you know doing a, uh, extra procedures uh, may prevent but nobody else has been actually able to show that and um, unless uh, you have something to share sriganesh Uh, i think pavel studelka also has uh, some data and for hyperopia i think it is useful because for hyperopia it's both epithelial changes and biomechanical changes uh, that cause the regression so young patients whom you are doing hyperopic treatment uh, above two diopters then i usually cross link and i find that it is helpful uh, from two to four diopters if you cross link them then the amount of uh, regression is less so only is for hyperopia i'm using yes okay i'm positive yeah. of time we have to go on Our next speaker is Dr. Sri Ganesh, the ever giving hero in cataract and refractive surgery, and he is going to tell us about enhancements with smile. On to you. Thank you, Chitra, and uh, uh, for inviting me to this uh, very nice refractive symposium. So we'll go on to enhancements after smile. Is my uh, is my are my slides visible? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So smile itself, the long-term stability is excellent and. what we have been seeing is that i have been doing smile since 2012 and about 8000 cases and our enhancement rate is just about 0.2% we have treated less than uh, 40 of these eyes with uh, uh, enhancements uh, so it's extremely rare but let us look at uh, the enhancement techniques after smile for residual refractive error and generally they are 
four approaches. One is surface ablation, the other is a thin flap LASIK, and uh, then you have the circle software, uh, which makes converts the cap into a flap, and then you can do uh, LASIK uh, ablation. And uh, the last is subcap lenticule extraction, or what is also called re-smile, where you can again do a smile. So coming to PRK after smile, this is the simplest procedure to do. Ideal for low enhancements, uh, if you are just 0 0.5, 0 0.75 adapters. Um, but uh, epithelial thickness to be taken into consideration, especially if you are doing trans-PRK. And uh, you will have to use larger zones. Otherwise, uh, you may not get the adequate uh, uh, correction. And I generally like to use mitomycin C 0.02% uh, for almost a minute. Again, this is controversial because some people say that about 20 seconds, it does not really matter, but uh, uh, the incidence of haze can be higher post-smile and post-LASIK if you do an uh, ablation. And you can see this is a picture showing a faint haze, which you, you can see, and this actually reduces the quality of vision. And uh, we find that there is increased risk of haze uh, with PRK after smile. Uh, but the advantage of this procedure is you can maintain uh, the flapless procedure and the biomechanics. Uh, this is a paper uh, published in GRS which showed enhancement of uh, um, uh, using surface ablation after smile uh, by Walter Secundo and group. And uh, their incidence was uh, almost 2.2% in uh, 2000 odd eyes where they did uh, uh, surface ablation and found that uh, it was uh, quite good and effective. Then you have LASIK after smile, and it can be done, especially if you use uh, thicker smile caps of 135 microns or more, but most of us use 120 microns. So if you want to do a thin flap LASIK after smile, uh, then 135 microns uh, being used routinely, which uh, Dan Reinstein does, and this is good for low enhancements also. Epithelial thickness, again, to be taken into consideration when you're um, planning the flap thickness and uh, femtoflaps flaps of 100 to 120 microns are ideal. There is a risk of entering the previous interface if you use a thicker flap and the hinge has to be planned to be away from the smile access incision. If you, so if you have used your access incision at 12 o'clock, use a nasal hinge. And this is a publication by uh, Dan Reinstein group. He normally uses 135 microns uh, cap and his incidence of retreatment is almost 4.4%. Uh, and uh, outcomes after uh, thin flap LASIK, uh, he reports to be very good. Uh, and uh, uh, But I think if you are not using a thicker flap, then this is not an ideal approach. Uh, this, uh, again, is uh, an approach which uh, even the company has a special circle software, which is an enhancement solution for smile. It allows the surgeon to convert a smile cap into a flap. And uh, the circle option permits planning and creation of different uh, incisions. And usually there are three incisions. One is the lamellar ring, and then you have the side cut with the hinge, and then you have the junction cut. And uh, right now it's not approved in the US, but it is available in India. And there are different patterns for uh, circle treatment. And uh, normally we use the C or the D pattern. And uh, this is the approach which we like now because with PRK, again, there's a delayed recovery and there is pain, but with the circle software, of course, you uh, the biomechanical advantage of a flapless procedure is lost, but uh, the patient satisfaction is quite good and the results are quite predictable um, in what we see. So most of the enhancements uh, we do is, this is the circle software where you have the um, lamellar cut, the um, junctional cut, and then the side cut, and then you can, uh, it converts the, smile cap into a flap and you can lift this flap. You can see that is uh, how you lift a femto flap and you're able to easily get into the interface. And then you can uh, go ahead, uh, shift the patient under the eczema laser, lift the flap, and then you can do an eczema uh, laser ablation. So it's quite easy to convert the cap into a flap with the circle software. There is a little bit of resistance there. You can also use a two-hand technique. And then that is the minutes, uh, bed, sir. which is done. Okay, I'm almost. Uh, this is a article showing by Ekta Chansui um, demonstrating the, uh, and he says the safety and efficacy of circle software is very good. 
and uh, Jod Mehta and group compared the four uh, different patterns and found that the D pattern was quite good in rabbit size. They also compared surface ablation, uh, circle software, and uh, uh, you can read the paper. But the last uh, technique is smile on smile. Can be done if previous cap thickness is known and can be used for higher refractive error enhancements. Epithelial thickness has to be taken into consideration. This has the advantage of maintaining a flapless procedure. After refractive cut and side cut, the suction is put off. So this is something that the surgeon does. It's not a software in the machine. So you have to put off the suction after the refractive cut and side cut. And the original axis incision is open. The old interface basically is the superficial plane and this can be easily uh, opened up. Then the deeper plane is dissected carefully and the lenticule is extracted. And the minimum thickness of lenticule should be maintained for easy extraction. So I keep it at 25 or 30 microns. Residual stromal thickness should be adequate for this procedure. So uh, basically higher refractive errors, one diopter or more, you can use this. And centration is uh, critical. Let me just uh, show you, we have done only a couple of cases and this is the topo pre and then uh, post enhancement. You can see the uh, flattening after enhancement and the reduced uh, corneal thickness. And uh, this is just a short video showing the procedure. So you, after the refractive cut and the side cut, you put off the suction. So you just lift your foot off, put off the suction. Then you open up the original incision and then you get into the uh, superficial plane, which is very easy to dissect. It's the original plane, which is above the refractive cut, which you have created. Then you enter the deeper plane, which is the refractive cut, which you have uh, uh, performed. That's the superficial plane. In the deeper, and then you can just remove the lenticule. So this is how you do a re-smile. And this was first uh, reported by David uh, Donate. And uh, this is his uh, paper in the JRS. And uh, there is also uh, this paper by George Mehta where he has compared the various techniques and the tissue response in rabbits for those who are of you all are interested. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sri Ganesh. That was a very informative presentation. Dr. Praveen, you could introduce Dr. Ram and I'll just ask one question to, because I think we are really running short of time. Does it make sense to have a thicker cap if we want to do a smile on a cap like in as a routine or even if you're going to do a flap on a cap? So see, a what happens is, see, if, you, if your corneal thickness is adequate, then you can have this approach. And this is what uh, Dan Reinstein does. He has a thicker cap because he says that uh, the anterior stromal fibers uh, contribute more to the biomechanics. So he likes to have a thicker uh, cap and uh, he uses a 135 uh, uh, cap and then he uses 100 microns to do a, uh, a thin flap uh, LASIK for enhancements. But in our situation in India, generally the corneal thickness is not that good. And most of us use a 120 with uh, micron uh, cap thickness. And uh, some of us even a 110 or 100 micron if we don't have adequate uh, thickness and we are correcting a high uh, refractive error. So in, these, in this situation, it becomes very difficult. You should not do a thin flap LASIK because if you use a 120 micron and you have uh, uh, maybe like 100, you've got 100 or 110 micron and then you have epithelial uh, thickening also. And then you you can have problems. You can enter into the interface uh, when you are making a thin flap LASIK. So ideally, it should be 135 microns or more if you are there to use this approach. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Praveen, could you introduce the next speaker? Yeah, I guess continuing uh, on the theme of SMILE, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ram Murthy who is going to be speaking to us about how you deal with a retained lenticule after SMILE. All of you know Dr. Ram Murthy. He's uh, been there, done it all. So he doesn't need any introduction. Thank you, Praveen. And thank you, ARC, for this kind invitation. Uh, so how do I deal with remnants of lenticule post smile? A very unusual complication. I'm just going to uh, share with you three case scenarios which we dealt with. Uh, this is case one, a run of the mill case, a lady who came with bilateral minus 1.5 doctors of refractive error. We thought it's just a walk in the park case. One mistake that was done is in these small errors, usually we give a, increase a minimum lenticule thickness to 30 microns. But my optometrist who was assisting me had made a mistake and he just fed it as 10 microns. So obviously we ended up with a situation where the lenticule which needed to be taken out was extremely thin. And uh, 
as you can see here, the smile procedures seem to be progressing quite uh, routinely. And I thought yeah, everything was under control. The laser, there was uh, nothing much to it. Usually, I create a plane of cleavage anterior to the lenticule and then posterior to the lenticule. I did encounter some amount of resistance when I went posteriorly. This is the routine way of uh, just my way of uh, separating the uh, anterior surface uh, from the cap and then posteriorly also went off routinely. Uh, it was only at the time when I was removing the lenticule. As you can see, it's an extremely thin lenticule and I thought that it is only half the lenticule that has come out. Uh, in spite of all the experience, it does happen once in a while. I usually you are able to identify the rest of the lenticule that is over there. So I went back again and uh, could identify a, a piece of the lenticule over there. And uh, you can see me taking out the second piece of the lenticule. Unfortunately, I discarded the first half with the two segments. I thought I think the lenticule is broken. I thought the case is over. But uh, the problem was an exposed opportunity when the patient came. Very happy with the first eye, but extremely unhappy with the right eye. She had initially come with a minus 1.5 diopters, and this was the refractive error, minus 2 with 3.5 diopters of cylinder. And very unusually, there was a, a very well circumscribed uh, um, bow tie, vertical bow tie that was there in the center. Obviously, thought there is an uh, uh, element of lenticule that's left over. This was in the uh, immediate first op, uh, second post op, first post operative day. And we are taken back, and you can see the incision being opened up. There was a significant amount of searching that I did. Then it struck me that somebody had suggested that you could use diluted tramstone estate, and it's one in five tramstone estate that I'm in injecting into the lenticule. Immediately, you can see over here this getting very well circumscribed. This is actually right in the center. This is the piece of lenticule that was left over. I had actually removed a piece at the bottom and Superiorly, and you can see the lenticule of the uh, That's the lenticule being removed, and the balance of the lenticule being removed. This was in the first post operative day. I'm sorry, the video done. Right. I would like to go back again. Uh, just to show you the way the initially I could not delineate the lenticule. But then once I inject a tramstone estate, I find that this is really helpful. Any small remnants immediately stand out. And you can see that uh, uh, both the confines, the superior as well as the inferior. And then so it was actually stuck on the back of the cap. And I had to scrape it off the back of the cap. And that's been the piece of the lenticule being removed, which is right in the center. And that's the reason that was causing a significant residual refractive error over there. And that's the uh, very thin lenticule remnant that's being removed. And uh, the results were very gratifying, both for me and the patient. The first post operative day was Plano 6-9. Still, there you see some kind of steepness in the center, which did disappear over time. And maybe because of the use of tramstone also, this is the first post op day picture where it, you know, the eye looks quite pristine. Going on to a second situation, this was actually One a patient. Minute referred to me uh, one month post-op and you can see a significant uh, uh, residual error and you can see the significant difference in the curvature 40.5 in this side and 45 over here and uh, in the anterior segment OCT there was a suggestion of a lenticule be being left over but the anterior uh, the um, thickness measurement was quite uh, cl uh, clinching in the sense you could see temporarily it was much more thicker compared to nasally and this gave me an idea there is some amount of uh, residual lenticule that's left over. And when I uh, took a look in the slit lamp with the slit lamp with the um, pupils dilated, you could see the rugosity temporarily, which was not there initially. So essentially, I went back again and you can see this uh, procedure here. I did not use the um, tramstone estate because I could easily identify the lenticule and uh, this could be removed quite uh, simply. And uh, by going both anterior and posterior to where I suspected the lenticule was, and it could be separated from the uh, cap. And that's the dissection. Mind you, this was done almost a month and a half after the primary surgery had been done elsewhere. But I had enough indication to tell me that it was a remnant of a lenticule which was there left over temporarily. And that's the lenticule which is being removed. And uh, you can see that finally comes out quite, and that's being spread out. and made sure and uh, that uh, the rest of the lenticule had come out. 
and this is uh, the first post of the day uh you see that um the one is realized it's six hundred and visual last time my videos this was actually soon after my uh, we got the machine uh one week after the primary surgery had been done one of my colleagues had done it he was just not able to remove the lenticule though the laser passage had been quite adequate and in this case a week later i went in actually i repeated the entire process of removing the lenticule went uh, anteriorly then posteriorly and the lenticule came on uh, out as a whole you can see that the uh, the opening is 4 mm since fairly uh, opened up because of the significant uh, uh, maneuvering that the primary surgeon had done during the first surgery uh, but suffice it to say that if the uh, laser passage has been quite adequately uh, adequate you can invariably identify the lenticule remove it in toto or its remnants thank you so much for your kind attention uh, thank you dr ramurthy uh, uh, dr gitansha you could share your uh, thing just one last question one question if you are unable to find the remnant what would you do i think you just have to bait it out if it's uh, it's not causing a problem maybe nothing needs to be done but if there is significant uh, irregular astigmatism that is there maybe three months down the line once it has stabilized we have to do a topo guided laser treatment of sufficient corneal tissues available obviously it's a difficult situation Thank you, you can also do a open exploration you can use the circle software yes. uh, convert it into a flap and do an open exploration alternatively if you have a ioct then you can also see immediately on the ioct where the lenticule is where the lenticule is it's you can make out and you can take it out looking at the intra opacity microscope uh, number the i don't have access to ioct but, but i'm saying if you have then ioct i'm uh, and never able to make out very clearly is it very obvious in the iso iso it is it is quite obvious in the intraopacity microscope thank you our next speaker is dr geetansha sachdev an essential part of this young force which is uh, very well informed as we are seeing in these webinars She's consultant cataract and refractive at the eye foundation group of hospitals and she is going to deal on how to plan topo guided treatments in early keratoconus on to you geetansha Thank you. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Yes. All right. So uh, my talk today is on how I plan topo guided treatment in early keratoconus. Uh, I have no financial disclosure. So topo guided treatment with CXL essentially falls under the gamut of CXL plus, where alongside the cross linking we do a refractive procedure in order to regularize the curvature of the cornea and hence improve the refractive error postoperatively. So how does this work? Topo guided PRK essentially entails a myopic as well as a hyperopic ablation in order to regularize the cornea. So you will have a myopic ablation at the area which corresponds to the increased curvature or the maximum area of the cone to flatten it, and there is a paracentral hyperopic band which steepens the cornea anterior to it, thereby causing surface regularization. So let's look at some of the general guidelines when it comes to planning the treatment. We know that mild to moderate cases of keratoconus are ideal indications for this treatment, but there are certain principles that one needs to keep in mind, which I will be discussing in the subsequent slides. So there have been a number of protocols that have been described, but the general consensus is that the minimum preoperative thickness (epi on) should be around 450 microns. or the minimum thickness after the topo guided prk and the epithelial removal should not go below 350 microns so on and off that gives you around 50 microns of tissue to play with however there are certain publications wherein they've gone with ablations which are as deep as 80 microns provided the preoperative corneal thickness was adequate so at the end you should not leave behind less than 350 microns here the optic zone size can be reduced to around 5.5 mm in order to save some tissue emetropia here is never the goal all you're trying to do is make the cornea a little more regular in order to have better postoperative vision additionally cxl here has a hyperopic shift and a refractive effect which needs to be kept into mind so as a general protocol one should undercorrect for about 40% in the conventional approach which is associated with more haze and more flattening as against the accelerated protocol which should have about a 20% undercorrection 
So essentially, one begins with correcting the higher order abrasions, then goes on to debulk as much of the cylinder as the tissue allows, going up to about 80% with the accelerated protocol. And then if there's any tissue left behind, we correct the sphere. Now it works both for centered as well as decentered cones, and there has been an improvement in the visual acuity and keratometry in both. However, significantly better results were found with centered cones. They've also tried this with the wavefront guided approach. The uh, advantage would be that there would be lower ablation depth at the thinnest point. However, the challenge is that a wavefront is not repeatable. It also takes into consideration the internal abrasions along with the cornea and is dependent on things like the accommodative status and the pupil. So the tomography would give you a more repeatable scan and obviously you could get a larger area when you're planning the treatment. So this is just a few of the examples which have undergone topoguided treatment where you can see there is a cross reduction in the eyes asymmetry and post regularization there is an improvement in the corrective distance visual activity. Now this is a centered cone where you can see more than 50% of the posterior float elevation is well within the three millimeter zone and the patient has done well. Having said that, decentered cones can also do reasonably well, wherein you can see that there is a gross eye asymmetry, and this is a decentered cone. However, the patient following the treatment goes on to achieve a corrective distance visual acuity of 2020. Just another few examples showing the corneal surface regularization and the subsequent improvement in the distance visual acuity. Centered nipple cones do exceedingly well, where you can see that there's almost no trace of the keratoconus on the curvature map postoperatively. Now, another important thing that entails discussion is the way to remove the epithelium. Now, we all know that the keratoconus has an irregular epithelium, wherein it is thicker over the depressed areas and thinner over the area of the cone. So when we do the planning, it is done with the epithelium on. However, once we remove the epithelium using either the manual or the alcohol method, the stroma that we've left one behind minute. with, yeah, I'm almost done. The stroma that we left behind with is grossly different from what the planning initially was. So laser ablations, which give you a uniform 50 micron ablation would be better because what you're left behind with underneath closely mirrors the preoperative treatment and results in better refractive and visual outcomes. There are just a couple of questions that are still unanswered. How much ectasia can we treat well? What should be the attempted correction? And can we go beyond an ablation depth of 80 microns if we have enough tissue? Also, uh, Keratopolis has described early results of combining customized CXL with the topoguided treatment and has they have, uh, the eyes have done exceedingly well. However, we will need certain more studies in order to see the uh, how both customized CXL and topoguided PRK with CXL work. So I just like to conclude by saying this is a promising procedure, especially for early keratoconus, and it does offer the patient a certain degree of spectacle independence postoperatively, which would not have been possible with cross-linking alone. Thank you. Thank you, Gitansha. That was a very crisp talk. I have a question for you before we go on to our next speaker. If the corneal thickness allows, should topo-guided treatment with cross-linking be the norm? Or do you see a role of doing cross-linking alone in early keratoconus? Uh, I personally think that if the patient does not have a good best corrected spectacle visual acuity, uh, a combination with a topo-guided PRK does exceedingly well. So if there's enough tissue, one should go on to treat as much, rebuild as much cylinder as possible, and also the sphere, and uh, the patient would do exceedingly well. Anything to ask, Dr. Praveen, before we go to our next speaker? Nothing specific uh, because I think we're running short. We'll probably move on, but uh, nice talk, Kitansha. And I uh, would like to uh, invite Dr. Namrata Sharma, uh, who is another young dynamic uh, secretary of the AIOS. Uh, so she's going to be talking to us about iatrogenic ectasia and uh, how you manage iatrogenic ectasia. Dr. Namrata Sharma. Thank you, Praveen, and thank you being, for being so kind. Uh, you're calling every speaker young. So... <laughs> Thank you. I would be talking to you about iatrogenic ectasia, how to manage it, and I would like to thank uh, Chitra and team ARC uh, for this. 
so it can occur after refractive surgery which we are talking about so it can occur after prk lasik and smile both uh, all three of them it occurs more often after lasik as compared to smile and prk as has been reported in literature and uh, basically biomechanical corneal changes are associated with decrease in the udva steepening and thinning of the cornea and there are several criteria by which it is diagnosed but uh, uh, it is loss of uh, Uh, best connected visual acuity with refractive change of more than two diopters of spherical equivalent, topographic corneal steepening or torosity of uh, more than 1.5, and central steepening. Uh, then we diagnose post LASIK ectasia. The incidence in the recent times have reduced from 0.6 to 0.033 percent, and 50 percent occur in the first year, 80 percent occur in the second year. And uh, as was also uh, emphasized by uh, Dr. Gaurav Dutra, it can occur as early as one week after LASIK, or even can be delayed up to several years after the initial procedure. There are absolute risk factors such as the uh, functus keratoconus and keratoconus, and PMDs, and relative risk factor such as low residual uh, bed thickness, high myopia, thin corneal pachymetry, thick LASIK flap, uh, corneal topographical irregularity, PTA more than 40 percent, young age, and pregnancy. and there are three scoring systems uh, which describe at risk of ectasia uh, the erss by randelman the percentage tissue ablation by santiago and the score analyzer in opscan now it is important to note that the randelman uh, risk assessment was based on the placebo disc so the posterior elevation was not taken into consideration and although according to randelman the sensitivity is 91% and specificity is 96% but in another study by shan et al it was shown that the specificity is low it is to the tune of 56% likewise pta more than 40% is a risk factor for ectasia in normal topography and however most patients uh, when it was described had undergone a microkeratom lasik and so the flap thickness was 140 microns and no weightage was given for individual parameters such as cct or the ablation depth now uh, in in a subsequent paper by santiago he wanted to look at what plays more gives more contribution to ectasia whether it is flap thickness or it is ablation depth it was found that flap thickness is more significant and thick thick flaps were insufficient to cause ectasia in eyes with normal topography unless they are accompanied by higher ablation depths and high pta and so pta more than 40% need not ca cause ectasia again pta more than 40% is a risk factor in suspicious uh, topography this again was uh, Uh, proven in a subsequent paper by uh, Dr. Santiago, and uh, if we look at uh, this paper again, this looked at the PTA, and they said that there was there were patients with PTA more than forty percent who did not develop uh, ectasia over a two-year uh, uh, period, and uh, again uh, this looked at all the three systems, including the score system, uh, study done by Cordelia Chen, and score value of more than equal to zero was the most uh, predictive of ectasia and achieved the highest specificity and in eyes with normal topography use of combination of three system yields a greater sensitivity but it is at the expense of specificity so all the three scoring sy systems do have uh, some of the other limitation and uh, again uh, in this uh, which is the latest paper which looked at femtosecond laser assisted lasik as opposed to microkeratom lasik in the previous studies only four patients they develop post lasik ectasia with abnormal form of keratoconus now uh, this also uh, said that the posterior elevation after surgery though the change is minimal in most cases but it makes it difficult to diagnose post lasik ectasia solely on the basis of the posterior elevation if you look at the, uh, post lasik ectasia versus the primary corneal ectasia the difference is that the topographic corneal steepening or torosity will be more than 1.5 diopters and it is paracentral in keratoconus and mid peripheral in post lasik ectasia in the kmax value which is uh, 47.2 may not be there for post lasik ectasia because obviously these eyes have flatter corneas now the management mo modalities to are for halting the progression and for visual rehabilitation so you can give glasses you can give rgp contact lenses alternatively minimally invasive procedures are cross linking and intracorneal ring segments with or without cross linking and of course when it is extreme then we may have to do a corneal transplantation this was a meta analysis which looked at cross linking for post lasik ectasia where the udva remained stable with significant improvement in the cdva and topographic parameters they showed less positive response to collagen cross linking compared with the keratoconic corneas and stabilization of the corneal thickness was observed in all the studies with a maximum follow up of 42 months 
the intracorneal ring segments are indicated whenever there is loss of the uh, CDVA uh, after the development of ectasia, and both single segment and double segment have been used. And uh, uh, this essentially, uh, you have to give the uh, data to the manufacturer and they plan whether you have to use a single segment or a double segment. So these are the options which are available when you're using the intracorneal ring segments. Most studies uh, use intracorneal ring segments followed by CXL uh, one month later. And some like at our center, you also use simultaneous ICRS with uh, collagen cross-linking. And this is just to show uh, the case one where uh, uh, the B value of 4.9 is seen in the right eye with the post LASIK ectasia in the left eye, uh, 3.57. The refractive error was minimal. It was minus two, minus 2.5. And so sometimes you cannot predict uh, which of these cases is going to have uh, uh, ectasia. So we planned uh, collagen cross-linking in this case. And this is the follow-up at one month post CXL, then uh, three months and 12 months. And the, the uh, topography has uh, remained uh, almost, same, almost the same and has not progressed beyond uh, one year. Now, this is another case in which we, uh, we there was correction of minus five diopter sphere and the patient had good visual acuity for four years, but then developed ectasia more in the left eye as compared to the right eye. And we plan to do intacts with collagen cross-linking. And in this uh, double ring uh, intacts was used with the LASIK flap, which was visible. And again, uh, the D value in this case initially was uh, 13.16. It did decrease to 10.25, and the flattening effect was also because of the presence of the intacts. So to conclude, though the scoring systems are imperfect, the incidence of post lasik ectasia has actually reduced uh, to 0.03%. The characteristic pentachem findings are irregular astigmatism and central steepening. And collagen cross-linking is the treatment of choice to halt progression, although as compared to primary keratoconus, it probably doesn't work as well as in case of post lasik ectasia. Thank you very much for your kind attention. A very thorough talk, Dr. Namrata. I think leaves no questions to be asked. And also because we are running um, out of time, any questions we could keep for the end. That was a great talk. We go on to our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Praveen, would you introduce? Yep, the second half of the dynamic duo, uh, Batman and Robin. So uh, please welcome uh, Rajesh Sinha who is the treasurer of the AIS, who is going to be talking to us about uh, managing his post-PRK. Thank you, uh, Dr. Praveen. And i uh, just share my slides. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll just uh, share my slides. Do you have any question for Namrita? Uh, any of the... Okay, I think he's sharing his screen. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry for the... Yeah, a very good evening to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, for having me here and some kind words from Dr. Praveen. Uh, I'll be talking about corneal haze after surface ablation. Uh, there are ample studies in literature which states that uh, there is some risk of uh, haze following PRK. The subepithelial haze is seen in majority of cases. I mean, this is what these studies have shown. Uh, after PRK reaching the greatest intensity at three to six months and then gradually decreases from there. So, uh, and but most of the studies have shown, uh, of late, they have shown that most of the haze uh, is, uh, you know, clinically insignificant. And uh, this also includes studies wherein mitomycin C has not been used. But this is one study which states that one third of patients in spite of mitomycin C and ascorbate, they do have some degree of haze, although majority of these are clinically insignificant. But there are some cases wherein you can have a haze like this, which can have a clinical bearing. Uh, there are various risk factors like high myopic correction, more than six diopters. However, even the lesser corrections up to three diopters or um, four diopters, they can also have haze. But, and there are evidences and case reports in literature. Then uh, higher correction in terms of hyperopia or astigmatism, ablation depth high, again, for the same reason. 
and a smaller diameter ablation profile, retreatment, previous corneal surgery, and poor ocular surface are some of the risk factors that do cause uh, uh, occurrence of haze. And this haze is basically because of the exaggerated corneal healing response. When there is an epithelial injury, there is a release of inflammatory mediators, and then these, uh, there's keratocyte apoptosis, these activated keratocytes, they interact with uh, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, these inflammatory mediators, and then they create a myelofibroblast, uh, and these are highly reflective and less transparent and they cause haze. And basically, it's the epithelial base membrane, membrane that is, uh, you know, the breach of this membrane that has been held responsible because of uh, because then that can cause interaction between the, uh, it exposes the keratocytes to the inflammatory uh, mediator that is pre present in tear film. And another issue why uh, higher corrections have higher chance of uh, haze is that there can be some irregularity in higher corrections, you can have some some uh, you know uh, irregularity in the surface, in the treated surface, and that can also lead to haze formation. More apoptosis, more activated keratocytes, more interaction with uh, inflammatory mediators, more haze. There can be two types of haze. One is transit transitory haze, which is transient, which occurs early and then resolves uh, after some time. And sometimes you do have a late onset corneal haze, which occurs starts uh, later, two to five months after surgery, and can last up to three years or so, and even last a small degree of haze can even last forever. Uh, you can quantify haze objectively by confocal microscopy or shrimp fluke densitometry or ASOCT, or subjectively by slit lamp findings, depending upon the clinical details noted behind the haze. Now this is the confocal microscopy, uh, confocal microscopic image which shows the quantification of haze. You can see that this, this is the deeper endothelial side. These are the keratocytes, these are nerves which have been damaged after PRK. And uh, this is the uh, subepithelial area wherein you can see uh, you know, highly reflective uh, matrix material, which are myelofibroblast, which gives the idea that uh, this, is the, uh, this is the amount of haze. As far as management of haze is concerned, prevention is done uh, in the form of uh, use of mitomycin C in most of the PR case. Now, earlier people used to use mitomycin C in cases of more than uh, correction when correction was required for more than minus three diopters. But now uh, there's ample evidence that even for less than three diopters, there are occurrences of haze. So people do use uh, mitomycin C prophylactically in all the cases of PRK. 0.02% for variable time, but I use it for 30 seconds. Uh, the, this is one study which has shown that, you know, mitomycin treated eyes had minimal haze, whereas the control eyes wherein mitomycin C was not used, uh, haze was quite significant. Similarly, there are some other studies which have shown that use of mitomycin C does prevent occurrence of haze or does prevent the severity of haze. Uh, this is a, a safety study, the US Army study, which states that uh, you know PRK with mitomycin C for 30 seconds had no measurable levels of mitomycin C in blood and it has systemic safety. Uh, there are some other agents like uh, topical steroid within the first 42, first 72 hours is supposed to prevent haze formation. Now, there, there is a concept that majority of us, we feel that in the first 48 to 72 hours, till the time there is epithelial healing, we should not use topical steroid that will prevent uh, the you know, epithelial healing. But uh, there are a couple of studies which have shown, which have compared use of steroid in the first 72 hours and later, and they have found out that in those cases wherein uh, steroid was used in the first 72 hours, the amount of haze was lesser for the similar amount of correction. And high dose of vitamin A, vitamin E, and vitamin C have also been uh, advocated. Some newer modalities like plasma, rich in growth factors, Topical interferon alpha 2b has anti scarring effect. Anti TGF drug like trichostatin A. Now, a word about uh, trichostatin A or anti TGF drug uh, uh, before gene therapy, I would like to say that there are two isoforms. The TGF is basically for the corneal wound healing, and it has two isoforms T1 and T3. T1 is more for the fibroblastic activity, like it creates more of myelofibroblast, and T3. Uh, you know, has, uh, you know, when you activate T3, it inhibits fibrotic markers. So in vitro studies are being done wherein T1 stimulation is reversed by introducing T3 
uh, and uh, there are uh, a couple of studies which have reported some good results uh, in in vitro system. Maybe with time you will be able to know about it. And of course, gene therapy has also been done. If there is occurrence of haze, then as far as surgical treatment is concerned, superficial debridement with application of topical mitomycin C followed by polishing with burr helps in many cases, what I have seen, the diamond burr, which we normally use in most of these cases wherein, you know, like uh, posterior surgery, polishing, even in these haze, diamond burr is quite useful. And of course, PTK with mitomycin C, 0.02% is used uh, for removing the haze. Just a word about the uh, duration of mitomycin C, for profile access in cases wherein you are doing a PRK and using MMC for profile access, uh, it is used for slightly lesser duration. I use it for 30 seconds and for treating a haze, I go a little longer uh, and that is 45 seconds. Uh, some studies have you know, taken it, used it up to one minute or up to two minutes, but I use it only for 45 seconds if I treat a case of haze wherein I have done PTK. Uh, just one more point that you do can have some degree of myopia if you have a haze, significant haze. But that haze causes pseudomyopia. So there's no need to treat that myopia additionally because the haze should be removed with PTK and that will take care of the pseudomyopia that uh, occurs because of haze. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajesh. That was a very thorough talk. I just have one doubt. Now, if yeah. you have haze, it's not that pseudomyopia, but there is some residual error. And uh, you know that it's difficult to measure the corneal thickness uh, if there is presence of haze. So what would you do that? Would you, in such a situation, do a PRK or a PRK? Uh, I would, if it's a significant haze, I would first remove the haze with PTK and won't uh, correct for for myopia. Because if there's a significant haze, depending, I, I see how much is the degree of myopia. If the myopia is just minus one or even up to one minus 1.5, uh, I would just uh, remove the haze and use mitomycin C, 0.02% for 45 seconds, and then see in the post-op period how it behaves. Thank what you. is the role of uh, sunlight that you see? Yes. It could be very persistent. And yes. would, you, would you have anything for the PRK patients and sunlight? Yes. That's a very relevant Sorry. question. Yes. Sorry? Sun sun ex exposure to sunlight is also one uh, important cause for uh, haze occurrence. So, ultraviolet... Uh, actually, 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 the thing is that uh, there are anecdotal reports. Actually, they, uh, people have used chilled BSS to reduce uh, the you know inflammatory activity. People also implicate sunlight because it probably increases the inflammatory activity. But uh, there is no comparative study showing that sunlight does increase haze. I mean, there are reports, but... Uh, there's no comparative study that uh, you know sunlight does uh, increase haze in cases of PR. Actually, I have a patient who was fine for almost three weeks, and then following that, the haze increased phenomenally for the next three weeks. Praveen, you've done so many PRKs. What is your take on it? Yes, I think yeah. uh, the duration of time which Dr. Praveen uses is also the he uses mitomycin longer, like I think ten seconds for every diopter. No, that makes a difference in. Yeah, so the number of cases we've had to retreat for haze have been, I think I remember only one case in the last uh, 14 years or so that we had to retreat for haze after PRK. So I think it has to do with the mitomycin C duration. And like uh, Dr. Mehta asked, the sunlight exposure is something that we emphasize. Everybody use UV protection after surgery. There actually is uh, an observation that during the months of summer, Patients tend to come back with more haze as compared to the months of winter. And uh, there seems to be a biphasic variation there as well. So there is some correlation. And so we tell them to make sure that they protect their eyes from UV light. Just to yes. add to what we already mentioned, uh, uh, what Himanshu asked, it's already well documented, something called holiday haze, where immediately after PRK, patients went on a skiing holiday and many of them came back with uh, haze. So there is some correlation, but really not... Uh, uh, absolutely established in literature, but the incidence of haze increases once you are exposed to UV light. And that's the reason that we recommend usage of uh, protective glasses for a longer period, like steroid drops also, after PRK compared to Plaplessing. How long, how long the UV protective glasses? 
actually uh -huh. uv rays increase apoptosis and when there is increased apoptosis there is greater uh, there is an increase in the extra uh, cellular space and that has been uh, uh, you know implicated that has been probably uh, you know suggested as probably one of the reasons why and these activated keratocytes plus the increased swelling because of the increased extracellular space because of increased apoptosis because of uv rays probably has some role to play now rajesh is speaking like a professor <laughs> uh, rajesh was given a wonderful talk last question last question when yeah. would you stop it that enough is enough and do a ptk uh in a haze yes now 3 months 6 months when when would you decide that now enough is enough steroids are not working the haze is increasing and i'll do ptk now what's your cut off factor i i think 6 months dr pravin anything any pravin he has no experience he says he doesn't have haze in his side <laughs> <laughs> i didn't say that i said somebody requires retreatment i think only one I, we had to do pravin is so variable uh, because many of these patients are referred many of the patients are referred so it, it's so variable time that you know so pravin what is your secret of success you have no haze Yeah, with no mitomycin. Mitomycin. How much? What? Ten seconds for diopter. Sorry. Ten seconds for ten diopter. Ten seconds for diopter. And he, I think he would correct even up to beyond eight. I think no, if the corneal eight. thickness allows. I think said in the beginning nine. nine. There is an anecdotal patient that Praveen likes to talk about in the end. The end, he discloses who that patient is. but i think paucity of time we are going to go on to our next speaker uh, next speaker is none other than my very efficient co moderator dr praveen krishna who is going to talk on phagy kyols in keratoconus thanks uh, chitra and thanks uh, to uh, everyone for the uh, wonderful discussion and thanks to the arc and uh, especially to uh, chitra for having me on this uh, panel uh so i'm going to be speaking in the next 5 minutes or so about uh, fakey kyols in keratoconus and the questions that i hope to answer in the next 5 minutes would be do fakey kyols actually work for patients who have keratoconus what kind of keratoconus do they work best in how is planning for fakey kyols different in keratoconus from a routine patient and a little bit about the outcomes of these surgeries So uh typically if you look at the surgical options for a patient who has keratoconus that divided into either stabilizing surgeries or vision correction surgeries so stabilizing of course is called in cross linking vision correction you can broadly divide them into implants and transplants and among implants is where fakey kyol actually fits in and of course we're not going to be talking about the other kinds of surgery today So a little bit of literature just to drive home the point about whether fakey kyols work for keratoconus or not and what kind of keratoconus they work uh, in most uh, case series that are available uh, that are published are, are small case series less than 20 patients and uh, that that itself will tell you that this is not a very commonly performed procedure but if you look at the corrected distance visual acuity of patients who undergone fakey kyols in patients who have keratoconus all of these actually are patients who have relatively good spectacle corrected visual acuity and if you look at the refraction most of them are people who have very high myopia and relatively lower astigmatism if you consider that all of these are keratoconus patients if you also look at the uncorrected distance visual acuity of patients you will also notice that all of them are not 2020 but they probably mirror the kind of visual acuity they had with spectacles before surgery and if you look at the topography k readings you'll see that most of these are mild to moderate keratoconus and not severe keratoconus that was about the artisan fakey lenses there also are smaller k series with the posterior chamber fakey kyols like the icl and the accuracy of these lenses if you'll see seem to be a little lesser in keratoconus as you would expect compared to normal patients but what is also important is the fact that these tend to be quite stable the refractive error is quite stable over a 3 year period but digging a little deeper into all of this is if you look at the kind of patients that have been operated the average age of patients operated for an icl are patients who are closer to 40 years patients who have a higher spherical equivalent and a relatively lower cylinder again for a keratoconus patient 
and patients where the best spectacle corrected visual acuity is actually very good. So that's the typical patient who seems to do very well with a fakey KIOL. And also, if you look at the mean K readings, you'll see that the highest K reading in this series was 52 diopters. So again, mild to moderate keratoconus. And if you look at the central corneal thickness, 500 microns again, which also tells you that this is not advanced keratoconus. Which kind of fakey KIOL? It seems that the iris claw as well as the posterior chamber IOLs tend to do equally well in cases of keratoconus with the posterior chamber IOLs doing a slightly better job than the iris claw lenses. So what are the variables that will be different in a patient with keratoconus compared to a normal patient? The five variables that we typically pay attention to in anybody whom we are planning fakey KIOL calculations, number one is the refraction. Well, what is interesting to see that is in patients with keratoconus, the variability in refraction, if you do refraction two times by the same person, is extremely high. And so that is another problem because this is what you're basing the ordering of the power of your fakey KIOL on. So you can expect greater variability in the outcomes because of the fact that the measured refraction by itself, both sphere as well as cylinder, tends to be more variable in keratoconus patients. Keratometry, again, though not of fundamental importance in fakey KIOL planning and calculations, is important to also know and correlate the kind of cylinder that you have. And if you have an eccentric cone because it is measured in the center, again, this could be erroneous. What is interesting is the anterior chamber depth measurements. And here is a very nice example that will show you that in patients with keratoconus, typically the anterior chamber depth in the center is deeper because of the cone. But this does not reflect the depth of the peripheral anterior chamber. So in patients who have normal eyes without keratoconus, the depth of the central anterior chamber tends to sort of be a surrogate measure for the depth of the peripheral anterior chamber as well, which tends to be deeper, especially in myopes. So if you do a fakey KIOL using the regular calculations in a keratoconus patients, it is more likely that you will end up with a shallower anterior chamber and a higher vault as compared to a normal patient. Again, I don't have evidence to show this, but this is an anecdotal observation amongst the series of keratoconus patients that we have. The other important thing is the white to white distance probably doesn't really matter here. But in some patients who had allergy and limbal papillae, taking the measurements from your automatic tools like your OBSCAN will be erroneous. So it's always important to ensure that you measure manually as well. And the last variable is the endothelial cell count. Again, what is interesting is keratoconus patients typically tend to have a lower endothelial cell count than normal patients. And this tends to become lower and lower as the severity of the keratoconus increases as well, because endothelial cells have a larger surface area to cover in a patient who has ectasia. So a case example, this is a 35-year-old lady whom we followed for five years who had stable topography and refraction, minus 13, minus 1.5, minus 14, minus th uh, 3. And she underwent a fakey KIOL post-op one month. She did very well with a slight residual error of a minus 1.25 cylinder in both eyes. 2025 and she was quite happy. As you can see, the vault is a little higher than what you would expect in a normal ICL patient. Post-op one year, she is also stable again with the visual acuity as well as the best corrected vision maintained with a slight drop in the left eye. We've looked at our data and we have about 19 eyes of patients who underwent ICL or any other fakey KIOL for keratoconus with a mean age of around 30 years. So you'll see that this is an older subgroup of patients who tend to be more stable. Average pre-op sphere is minus 11. Average pre-op cylinder was more minus two. And you'll see again, this also shows you that most patients are patients with central cones or patients who have a mild to moderate keratoconus. So to summarize what we found in patients who have keratoconus who undergo a fakey KIOL, Ensure that you explain that the patient is going to have a larger residual error range and not to expect uncorrected uh, visual equity of 20 by 20 or even no refractive error after surgery. Ensure that you look for stable refraction and keratometry. This could be variable depending on the age of the patient and the kind of keratoconus. But what is suggested in literature is two years. Two years is a very long time and probably six months to one year probably would be a more rational time that you look for stability. Ensure that you have good spectacle corrected visual equity because visual equity with the contact lens is never going to be replicated by a fakey KIOL in the eye. And also explain to the patient that they will get 
what they are seeing with spectacles or maybe just one line better than that. Always try to limit this to mild to moderate catechonus because predictability goes down as your K becomes higher and as your cornea becomes more eccentric as well. And if you have a patient who is who's progressing, ensure that you do a collagen cross-linking to stabilize the keratometry on the cornea. Once you're happy with the stability, you can go ahead with a fake KIOL. The other thing that is also helpful is to combine procedures, combine and use an intracornal ring segment to improve best spectacle corrected visual equity before you plan a fake KIOL. And the ideal time between these two procedures should be at least about six months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Praveen. That was a very good talk. Anybody in the panel have a question for him? Uh, just one point I would like to add that, you know, what Praveen told the last point, the combining ICRS, some of the catoconus patients, what I have uh, experienced a, a few of the patients who had high astigmatism. So I've used a single segment of uh, intracornial ring segment to reduce the astigmatism. And then I've gone with the, I'm mean, combined CXL with the ICRS and then uh, later on, after six months, went ahead with the ICL. So in those cases, it, it is good to combine. But most of these keratoconus cases have high astigmatism. So a single segment will be a good option in such cases. I would just like to emphasize a point which uh, Praveen already made in the sense that if you don't have tools to all this and don't understand everything, please go purely by spectacle corrected visual equity. Because uh, your uh, ICL or uh, fake intraocular lens is only going to correct refractive error. It's not going to do anything to corneal aberrations or corneal irregularity. So if they are happy with their spectacles, please go ahead and try fake intraocular lenses. But if they need contact lenses, uh, rigid gas permeable or rose scale lenses for uh, steril lenses for correcting their uh, refractive error, then they are not good candidates for fake intraocular lenses. Thank you. I just had one point that. Uh... Basically, how long? See, Praveen says you can wait up till two years, but many of these patients, um, after uh, cross-linking, they have a lot of disability uh, in the sense that they have to wear the contact lenses with the glasses. The vision is not, again, good, or they have a very high power. So I generally wait for three to six months and then do the ICL because after that, the change is not much. Because if, if you keep waiting, sometimes you have progressive flattening also, and it, the flattening can up, occur even up till six years, seven years. So the refraction, again, keeps changing in uh, keratoconus. So every time a person refracts, there is a little bit of variation. And uh, it is difficult to get an accurate refraction also with keratoconus. So these are the problems that generally uh, the patients want to overcome their disability of the high uh, refraction. So three to six months, but I tell them that there can be my changes, but they're okay with it. Please, uh, also a difference. Just of time, I'm going to go on to the next speaker. Um, and the Kumar doctor had got missed out. So he'll be our next speaker. Dr. Kumar, you could share your video. Uh, he's the chairman and uh, MD of the Kumar Doctor Eye Hospital and a versatile surgeon whom we all know, who's going to take us back uh, to an earlier step, reiterate the superiority of fake IOLs, that they are better than corneal procedures. On to you, Kumar. Are you muted? Okay. So you can see this? Yes, now we you can, can hear me? Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Chitra, for this opportunity and congratulations on a fantastic show. I think uh, Dr. Prabhin made my life a little simpler uh, since he spoke before me, but this was an article as, as in March 2020 where they've said that the iris claw fakic IOLs have excellent outcomes even in corneal ectasia. So this is what I think he was talking about. And these are giving excellent results. But if you look back at 2008, uh, surprisingly, long-term uh, uh, use of the artesian lens said that there was endothelial cell loss. So it was not doing so well then because the lens design has changed. Everything is done. We have used various uh, fakic IOLs many, many years back. And they gave excellent results in high myopia. So this was documented then. So these are the two fakic IOLs, which are the most popular ones which are used. One is the iris clip IOL and the star or any of the fakic IOLs which are posterior uh, placed in front of our uh, normal natural lens. There was another article on fakic IOLs which said that this did well. But as far as the toricity was concerned, it was not very, very stable. And that's the reason why they tend to rotate. And then came the 
perfection of sizing. Sizing was the most important thing where the mistake was being done. So here comes the next article about why fake chirals. And this was saying that in severe myopia, it gave much better predictable visual outcome than laser refractive surgery. So this was one more thing that was produced uh, out in 2000 and this was about in 2016. Coming to the American Academy, Stephen Lane believes that fake IO is the way to go. And this is not a very old article. And he said that this is a much safer prospective procedure. The main thing being that LASIK is all about subtraction. We know this, right? So we are removing tissue. While fake IOLs do not carry inherent problems with corneal surgery. So we are adding a lens. Okay, so we are not disturbing the other optical system at all. So we are not disturbing the cornea. We are not disturbing the natural lens. And we are adding a lens. So actually it aids and it really helps our patients. So this was again a report by Stephen Lane uh, as far as the American Academy was concerned. Then came the posterior chamber fake IOLs. And here they said the treatment was much better for high myopia. Initially, if you remember, we used to do fake IOLs for very high myopia of more than minus 12, 13, and 14. Now that came down to 10. And then it further came down to, and some of us use fake IOLs for more than minus 8. And of course, we know that the biggest advantage of fake IOL is the reversibility, immediate correction, which we know, stability, and relative simplicity. Uh, a lot of techniques of fake IOLs have changed over time. Previously, for example, in STAR ICL, I used to use methyl cellulose and now the new thing that we are doing is we can put the ICL uh, just under uh, irrigation and we really don't need to put pilocarpin to constrict the pupil and this itself made the stability and no need to remove methyl cellulose, no fear of the IOP going up, etc. Again, fake IOL in tough cases as rightly pointed out by Dr. Praveen Krishnan that it can be used in patients who undergone C3R. So I've used this in patients who had intacts with C3R uh, the biggest advantage of Intax is that it centralizes the cone. Once it centralizes the cone, we can go ahead and do the fake IOL. Of course, knowing that the chamber is deep enough to take a fake IOL, and this gave excellent results. We have to wait for the X amount of time, and that would give very, very good results. There was another study uh, by Nasir uh, which said about fake IOLs, and this was uh, almost uh, 69 eyes for 46 patients and ranging from as little as myopia of 3 to 25. And this gave excellent results. So myopia as little as 3 also was attempted with a fake IOL at that time and gave excellent results. Coming to fake IOLs and surface treatment. Now we all know, uh, as rightly mentioned by Dr. Rajesh Sinha, that surface treatments can lead to haze. Uh, fake IOLs is a lenticular path. We know this. Uh, no issue of knowing a vitamin D. Uh, no question of post-op period of recovery, uh, no issue of faster visual recovery, no question of wound healing, no question of apoptosis. So all that is taken care of when it comes to fake IOLs and surface treatment. So comparatively, uh, we know that surface treatments now with the new smart pulse treatment, the recovery is much faster compared to the older four days. Now it's almost two days, the pain is almost gone. But it has an element of a question mark in some patients and of course, as mentioned, uh, that ultraviolet light and exposure to UV light and the holiday haze can also happen in this case, which nothing of this type will happen in fake IOLs. Some studies had talked of rotation of IOLs, uh, the fake IOLs, and that's why the most important thing that has come in now is about sizing. So the sizing is now is much better. We have a big choice of Indian fake IOLs. The STAR ICLs are also available. The two companies from India, the IOCare and the Biotech, are also available. Another study from Academy where you will be surprised, uh, ever since fake IOLs have become FDA approved, and there was one article which mentioned that it devoted almost 12 out of 45 chapters to fake IOLs. But of course, this was in 2008. That is when fake IOLs actually picked up 2007 edition, where textbooks started writing more about fake IOLs after it got FDA approval. And so many chapters were mentioned about it. This is as fast as Academy 2020. There is a comparison between toric polymer IOL and a toric artifact fake IOL and visual outcomes. And they have shown promising results in terms of safety, efficacy, predictability, and correction of myopic astigmatism. So fake IOLs, we know now can even do toric corrections. They have been doing toric corrections, but even the iris claw fake IOL can do a toric correction. 
And this has been shown in a paired study, identical, these lenses were clinically superior to any other lens that was found. This was as part in the American Academy study. So this is the toric uh, fakic IOL that is now also available in the market. We also know that the star toric IOL is also available in the market. So lots of Indian companies are nowadays making uh, fakic IOLs too, but not enough published data is found on this as far as my knowledge goes, but of course, all of you can add to this. So what is the advantage that I find in a summary? Uh, no cutting of cornea, so all the benefits of no striae, micro striae, macro striae, no free caps, all that is gone. No upside down caps, everything is gone. The question of dryness is sorted out completely. Uh, no ectasia, that's one biggest benefit is there, so you're not touching the cornea at all. And no issue of cornea. You know, some of our patients do have 6-6 vision, they've undergone perfect smile, they've undergone perfect LASIK, and yet some of them do complain that they're not very happy with the quality of vision. So here, the biggest advantage is completely reversible. Up till now, of course, I have explanted one fakic IOL, which was the first design of the star. Now it's the fourth edition where the central hole has appeared. And that time it was much thicker, much bigger in size, and we had to explant it because of glaucoma. So the advantage in fakic IOL, I feel, is reversible. Cost is an issue if you get the fakic IOLs from abroad, but Indian fakic IOLs, you know that the cost is not that much of an issue. And application uh, of these IOLs after cross-linking, as lightly mentioned by Dr. Praveen. So replacing LASIK, I think for thinner corneas, now our cutoff is much better, thinner corneas. So if your cornea is thin and your anterior chamber is good enough, uh, higher refractive errors for more than minus eight. Uh, complex cases, if you do intacts with C3R, and if your cone is central, you can still go ahead and put a fake IOL. With the central hole, all the other complications have actually uh, gone. So in summary, yes, this option is quite possible and quite uh, available for our patients. Thank you very much, Kumar. You are so eloquent. I have two, three rapid questions for you. Um, would you sell your eczema and shift to fake IOLs altogether, number one? Number two is, uh, do we have studies we have said that after center of flow coming in, the incidence of cataract has totally gone? And the third question is, with the lens rise, which is being much discussed now, do you think there will be vaulting, increased vaulting of fake IOLs later? So the first question is, I will not sell my eczema. The second question is about vaulting. And I said, actually, the central flow is more for glaucoma and not for cataract. So the prevention of glaucoma, uh, and because I think Gaurav started this technique of putting irrigation, not putting methyl cellulose at all in the anterior chamber. So the question of your central flow getting blocked by methyl cellulose is completely gone. And that's the biggest uh, benefit that we get. So you can inject the uh, ICL uh, just under uh, saline and you don't really need methyl cellulose. Uh, as far as vaulting is concerned, yes, we have to look at the vault postoperatively in all the cases. But now I think with better size understanding with electronic calipers, with calipers, with OpScan and all those comparison data, the sizing is a little better. So now, in, in fact, last few months or few years, whatever we are seeing, the sizing is really sorted out. Once in a while, you may get a high vault, but otherwise it's not needing to an explantation. So that's not where we have reached. All of you may have more data, but this is what I've found in my clinical data. Kumar, regarding your question about comparing uh... The Indian lenses with the VCN, we recently did a study, an in-depth yeah. study, and uh, it is in print now in the JRS. It's been accepted in the JRS, and we found that uh, there is not much of difference. And even the right. Indian lenses with biotech, they, they perform very well. So you compared with biotech or IOCare? Biotech, biotech. This was a comparative study with biotech. I've done a comparative study with RIL of Appa Sami and ICL, and uh, most of the parameters were almost the same. Only the MTF was better. MTF on eye trace was better in ICL. Rest of the things were absolutely comparable. Dr. Praveen, could you introduce the next speaker? Thanks, Kumar. Thank you, Chitra. Well, I've been uh, introducing a lot of people saying that they were young, but now this next speaker is truly young in uh, all aspects. <laughs> uh, <laughs> didn't call me Praveen, I have an objection. You make everybody <laughs> introduce you, Kumar. So uh, you missed out. Well, you know what I think. Anyways, so we have Natasha Pauja who's going to be uh, speaking up to us about dry eye and uh, LASIK surgery. Uh, it's been subject to a lot of discussions that we've had uh, since the last two hours. So hopefully she'll clear up a few things for us. Um, thank you, Dr. Praveen, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you, ARC and Dr. Chitra, for this humbling opportunity. 
um hopefully in the next 5 uh, minutes i'll do justice to one of the most uh, common complications or side effects as we call it of refractive surgery especially uh, lasik now uh, this was a whatsapp uh, consultation i had done for a colleague of mine um she sent me this image a placido image and she said that after 3 months the patient has come to me with uh, no change in refraction but the quality of vision and the um, uh, the lines have reduced and uh, she said do you think it's post lasik ectasia and because of lack of elevation data and epithelial mapping i asked her could you just send me a clinical image so that we can uh, see the surface and this is what we found we found that the patient had severe dry eye um, uh, disease she had spks on the surface so uh, this is a very very relevant um, uh, topic simply because uh, more than half of our patients at the end of 6 months are are uh, suffering from um or are not able to get the full benefit of lasik simply because they're suffering from dry eye uh, like symptoms now how do we deal with uh, dry eye disease it's actually very simple and it's step wise but most importantly the first step is um is planning well which is uh, pre operative um, planning also the intraoperative intraoperative choices that we make uh, and how do we deal with it post operatively let's take it step by step pre operative the first thing that we do is when a patient walks in and is interested in lasik um or refractive surgery we give this questionnaire um well there are multiple questionnaires available the uh, i personally use the osti and the speed questionnaire it helps me decide if the patient needs a detailed uh, examination and a detailed dry eye evaluation um so this is what the patient is further subjected to uh, while the patient is uh, before the patient comes and sees me even before the patient undergoes refraction uh so um after getting uh, a detailed dry eye assessment done which includes getting the functional assessment that means looking at the quality of the tear film as well as the structure now the qualities can be uh, quality can be determined by keratograph um and the uh, tear film interferometry uh the quant the anatomy or the movement gland structure can be determined by uh by mebography and there are various tools available to do it um so in a clinic step wise what we do is uh plan it beforehand uh, see the patient very well take a detailed history and it has been done in this order so uh, after the questionnaires are uh, determined after which we see the patient on split lamp without disrupting the ocular surface the first thing that is done is the non invasive diagnostic modalities and then looking at the tear film composition in terms of osmolality or checking the mmp9 after which we touch the ocular surface by doing either shermers or tbart or staining the ocular surface further uh, we do do a systemic work up for all our patients um, and if we have the luxury of advanced diagnostics uh, we do look at the confocal microscopy and tear biomarkers um, so essentially it helps us decide in this multimodal uh, uh, you know uh, disease as to where we stand and especially the patient falls into the evaporative or the mixed type of dry eye disease we do treat these patients preoperatively now i have started doing irpl for my patients um uh, first two sittings go uh, before they are considered for refractive surgery and if the patient has got enough meibomian glands i do consider doing um, the thermal pulsation as well so after the patient is primed beforehand um, then i consider refractive surgery now the considerations that happen intraoperatively primarily is just one which is deciding what kind of refractive surgery would you choose if a patient has already dry eye disease now we know that there are uh, denervation um, methods that happen the less uh, um, denervating um, um, methodology would be with the smile uh, why is it so important is because it uh, the nerves on the oculus on the cornea maintain the ocular surface homeostasis which was al also discussed earlier um, and it is responsible for a lot of uh, ocular surface uh, uh disease uh, um pathophysiologies so what we have uh, documented is um and it has been published to death that uh, um lasik causes a uh, significant denervation immediately post surgery and it takes a few years for the nerves to grow back um so this was just me experimenting a little on um, uh, one of the smile patients and it was very encouraging to see that the nerves started regenerating 6 months uh post surgery which was um, um very very hopeful and this also probably explains why the patients post smile have less dry eye uh, like symptoms um and uh, what was other factor that uh, helps us decide is now the the questionnaire that we ask the patient to fill up beforehand this translated into a study that we uh, saw that 
patients who had significant higher OSDI also had so, uh, changes on the uh, corneal nerves as well as had increased dendritic cells. Now, this is a simple surrogate marker. You don't need a confocal microscopy to decide this. Now, if a patient has higher OSTI, we know that the patient is prone to have more uh, changes post denervation. Now, how did we translate this is that uh, we started looking at the OSTI more in detail and the patients who had higher OSTI, these patients before they're picked up for a refractive surgery, go uh, undergo vitamin D treatment. Now this has been published to death again. We have looked at the role of vitamin D and uh, dry eye disease. And it has seen in a clinical translation, we see that the patients do much better with vitamin D treatment preoperatively. Now here's another perspective while I was preparing this presentation, I came across patients, um, the neuroprotective role of citicoline, which has shown that instilling the drop three times a day um, show has shown that the corneal sensitivity improves as early as one week, as opposed to the control group, which took about three weeks for the corneal sensations to come back post LASIK. Now, this seemed quite encouraging, and I hopefully look forward to try this out in the clinic. Um, while uh, we are still waiting for it, and if you still decide to undergo, uh, decide to uh, take the patient up for LASIK, here are some things that we would want to look at. These are patients who are at higher risk of developing post LASIK dryer disease. Asian race and female sex are known to have more dryer disease. Other risk factors are higher refractive correction and higher ablation depth or thicker caps. Um, the modification that we can do uh, intraoperatively is that we can have uh, wider flap hinges and probably place the flap hinge nasally rather than placing it superiorly if it, if it suits your uh, surgical style. Uh, these are certain factors which will help us decrease the incidence of dry air disease post uh, refractive surgery. Now coming to uh, managing post-operatively, how do we do it? Now, uh, these are the possible mechanisms and I just made a flow chart of it. The ideal way would be to tackle one of them. Uh, so in, now we know that there is decreased corneal sensitivity. So there is increased inflammation because of which there is increased hyperosmolarity because the tear secretion has decreased and there is increased apoptosis because of the ocular surface damage. Now, why not target these uh, specific um, possible mechanisms? So what we do is essentially uh, have post-operative medications that are targeting these specific uh, 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 etiopathogenesis of dry disease. For instance, for immunomodulation, we pay, put the patients on cyclosporin uh, for a longer time, the other promising drug is uh, Zidra, which is yet to come in into the Indian market. Uh, autophagy induction would be um, very helpful, and this can be done by tear substitutes simply, uh, trehalos being one of them. And uh, osmoprotective um, agents as tear substitutes would be very, very encouraging uh, post-refractive uh, post surgery, post-LASIK. Um, other factors which uh, can help decrease the incidence of dryer diseases, we know that mebovin glands do uh, get affected in evaporative dry disease. So it would be important to tackle this post-operatively if the patient does develop uh, dry eye symptoms, especially evaporative dry eye symptoms. So considering lippy flow or in IRPL would be um, ideal to treat post-operative dry eye disease. Now, this is my cousin, um, uh, he had a, a loss of mebovin glands, so I did pre-IP, I mean, I had done IPL for him, and it was very encouraging to see certain mebovin glands coming back. I have absolutely no explanation why this happened, uh, but after this, I, I did his uh, refractive surgery, and he was very, very happy. So essentially, to uh, sum up, this is my post-operative medication uh, uh, treatment modality that goes on. Uh, they have an exhaustive list that the patients are put at least for six months. Uh, so to summarize, uh, it is important that we prepare well. Um, it would be important that we do certain modifications uh, for our patients to not develop uh, severe dry eye-like symptoms. And most importantly, to choose our uh, lubricants post-operatively that will reduce um, the incidence and the feeling or the sensations of dry eye-like symptoms that the patients experience. Thank you very much for your attention. That was a wonderful talk, uh, Natasha. Wonderful. So much of information and we didn't even have to give you warning at all that you were running late. That's the youngsters for us. I, I just you. have one uh, question, Natasha. The first case which you showed was very interesting, the topography. Yes, sir. Uh, so what did you do for that patient? Um, actually, the patient was put on uh, sodium hyaluronate 
um, to your substitutes. I'm yet to see. This was a WhatsApp consultation that uh, I did for a colleague. Uh, she sent me a placido image. Um, so I put her on sodium hyaluronate um, and gel-based formulations, and I'm yet to uh, get a report back. Okay. If you look at the topography, this is a very typical case. If you look at the topography and the staining pattern, this is a typical case of nocturnal and lag of thalmus. And we see Absolutely. many of these patients with, who have a band of uh, uh, the SPK inferiorly. And if you look at the topography also, the topography pattern is typical of nocturnal and lag of thalmus. And Absolutely. many a time we are looking at all other things, but we miss the lids. And uh, what I tell the attendants is to observe these patients when they sleep at night and then they don't close their eyes fully. So putting them on a gel at night and taping the lids, that improves their topography and then the corneas uh, clear up after a couple of days. Yes. Absolutely. I should have mentioned earlier, sir, I just asked her to put those uh, iPads. I said and when you use it in the airplane, just try and sleep with that. So probably it will be helpful. She was happy with it. But I, as I said, I'm yet to get a report back from the uh, referring surgeon. That but that a, is typical. I mean, if you look at the topography absolutely. and the staining pattern, okay. yes. speaker, it's typical. That was a very good observation, uh, Sri Ganesh. We shall now go on to our last speaker, member ARC West, a very dynamic person from Mumbai, who's going to tell us actually on the most quintessential issue, the essential pre-op worker for uh, refractive surgery. On to you, Anaga. Thank you so much, ma'am, and uh, thank you for so much for this opportunity. I'll just share my screen. Is my screen visible, ma'am? And am I audible clearly? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity on speaking on my take on essential preoperative workups in refractive surgery. In today's day of improving technologies and increasing confidence, we promise the world to our LASIK patients. But we need to remember that in order to get the best visual outcomes, we not only need to have a proper case selection and workup, but also precise surgical technique, good counseling, and excellent post-operative care. Yes, the proper workup of the patient begins right from the proper history and the age of the patient, a complete good clinical examination of the patient. And yes, the most important part is the refractive surgery workup which includes the topography, abrometry, pactimetry, tomography. And yes, today we have this epithelial mapping, dry eye evaluation, serum vitamin D. And in those cases where we are planning to probably use a phacic eye oil instead of LASIK, then the anterior chamber depth and the white-to-white -white measurement. Definitely, we need to also rule out the systemic contraindications to prevent any further complications. And we in our center and definitely everyone would be having some kind of a LASIK workup sheet where you not only have all the complete details of the, about the personal data of the, about the patient, the ophthalmic history, as well as all the other parameters regarding the clinical evaluation and the parameters and details of the flap that we have uh, would be doing in the intraoperative period and any events that, that may have happened. Needless to say, because it's a refractive surgery, the refraction has to be bang on target and we need to look for refractive stability. Also go in and look for other old prescriptions and old glasses of the patient. Definitely cycloplegic refraction is extremely important, especially in hyperopic patients. And in those patients who are low myopes and in the pre-presbyopic age groups, it's better not to push them too much for LASIK because they already have good vision for near without glasses. Those patients who have a history of chronic contact lens wear may have a peripheral neovascularization like this, which can bleed on table and we need to be careful about it or they may have evidence of uh, prior contact lens related corneal infections. And these spots could be uh, an indication that they have these kind of infections earlier. Again, uh, contact lenses need to be stopped at least a week before the surgery. And in case of RGP and toric, at least around three weeks before the surgery. Many patients could have corneal warpage like this and they need to be stopped and uh, look for repeated topography. Still the topography actually stabilizes. A detailed slit lamp examination, especially for ocular surface, is important. Rule out problems like meibomian gland dysfunction, blepharitis, and corneal dot opacities like this, which may have had uh, probably because of an old adenoviral conjunctivitis also, and this could probably hinder a femtolaser during surgery. Even sometimes things like a finger can actually probably come in the way of suction during a microkeratome lacing. 
definitely we cannot over emphasize the uh, need for a proper retinal evaluation of the periphery and need for laser treatment wherever it is required like dr natasha mentioned we have a dry eye evaluation definitely for all our patients including the osdi score the mybography tbert schmerz test including all the other tests also that she mentioned and many times in our practice also we have used the ipl treatment that we are having access to for many of these patients and stabilize the ocular surface before taking up the patient apart from the medical management it's not just the pre operative care but also the predictive care post lasik that is also important we need to avoid excessive flattening and excessive steepening of the cornea in order to prevent any night vision issues and yes anticipate flap complications in cases of very flat corneas or very steep corneas definitely the ectasia risk factor scoring system by randelman comes in handy and we need to remember to keep at least 300 uh, microns in the residual stromal bed be very wary of corneas that are less than 500 microns and definitely in case of very high myops it would be prudent to go in for a fake ocular rather than go ahead with lasik pta already dr namrata madam has alluded to and this definitely we keep less than 40% there are times where you may have a mild to moderate myopia with a good pakki and you may be tempted to go in there are many other centers in the periphery or in the rural areas where they may not have had access to tomography but even with the basic topography we need to look for red flags like this in inferior steepening like this and sometimes even the pathfinder can give you very very small points like a difference in the inferior superior keratometric value of more than 1.4 or a vertical coma or even if the patient is not actually accepting the entire cylinder that is in the manifest refraction that could be a red flag definitely tomography has to be a, a very very important and is the most critical part of the workup i have been using the pentacam you may also use the sirius or the galilee whichever you have access to it gives you the sagittal curvatures and the front and the back elevation and the global pachymetry map which is so essential the other factors that can be uh, or could be red flags are the sracs which may be more than 22 degrees you look for the thinnest uh, uh, pachymetry not be less than 480 the y coordinate of the thinnest location and if there is a difference between the topographic and manifest astigmatism of more than 15 degrees or more than one diopters it could be a red flag also a superior inferior difference in 30 microns or uh, the posterior corneal elevation of more than 18 microns should be a red flag the bad d display is very easy to read because of the color coding so the exclusion map as well as the difference map inferiorly gives you a very good indication of early ectasia and here definitely these are gross indicators the ctsp and the pti curves also should be looked at and if there is a deviation from the normal it has to be considered as keratoconus and look for all the high risk and the moderate risks also the inter eye corneal symmetry has to be looked at and definitely these cases should not be taken up for lasik uh, integration of uh, the biomechanical assessment along with the tomography is important so you have the cbi as well as the tbi index and the combination of these two will have definitely help in detecting ectasia in all these patients epithelial mapping for subclinical keratoconus has been um, used nowadays and you can see it by uh, seeing that there is a change in the um, Uh, epithelial map thinning at the tip of the cone and thickening in the periphery uh, osd also you can see the epithelial mapping there is a, a classification of the type of dry eye and in cases of especially prk where you can actually see the change in the epithelial map as the patient recovers in the next few months pupillometry can be done to decide the optimum optic zone size and in very large pupils it could probably indicate that the patient would have greater discotopsia post treatment angle kappa is so important especially in hyperopic treatments and in these cases you need to actually center the tra uh, treatment on the corneal vertex counseling it plays a very very important role give them realistic expectations and a brief about the potential complications and various other options as and when required so for example my one of these patients had a borderline pakki of 500 and in the one in the right eye had a very high myopia this was we did a fake ocular in the right eye and this is the post lasik uh, topography in the left eye which shows the central ablation what i want to tell here is this is the post surgical uh, uh, aberrometry and it shows and the, that, uh, uh, the higher order aberrations are comparable 
And last but not the least, prevent teaching related errors, ensure that correct data is fed, uh, good fluence test, and explain the procedure to the patient. So to conclude, the keys to success is refractive surgery is all about more and more care. Thank you so much for your kind attention. That was wonderful, Anaga. Just covered everything in that uh, five minutes. Everything which was necessary and uh, it was very enjoyable hearing you. Um, are there any questions before we conclude? Dr. Praveen? Uh, at least from the audience uh, panel, looks like there are no more questions that are pending. Oh, good. So, so I think I'll conclude then. I'm sure all of us know it's been one amazing webinar with so many stalwarts and their thoughts, which has been of great relevance. Uh, my very special thanks to every dear expert panel we've been lucky to have amidst us. Our charged fantastic set of speakers and outstanding co-moderator to run the show, Dr. Praveen. Our admin team headed by Kripal, our ever helpful Mr. Sunil, who is a webinar admin. Sai and Manjula from Numerotech, who have always been there with their great guidance and support. My very strong ARC team, Mr. Nikhil and Mr. Raman from Entod, for their steadfast commitment to sponsor every single event of ARC. And one and all of you who are still remaining in this dear audience, because it's your presence which encourages us to take steps forward with great energy each time. Thank you, one and all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Chitra. Thank very you nice so session. Much. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Very nice. Everybody spoke so Thank well. Very, so very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rajesh. For Thank putting you. this Good together. Night. Really good job. And, and really yeah. excellent job. Thank I think Dr. Chitra and Praveen, what a fantastic webinar. It'll be a huge resource for anybody who wants to learn refractive. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it will be available on Absolutely. YouTube, no? No, you know, I'm not, no, no, we are uploading everything onto the ARC website also. The ARC website. So every, every we like YouTube every... better, actually. Oh. The YouTube, the accessibility is better. <laughs> joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Congratulations, Praveen. Congratulations. Congratulations.